I was reflecting that um, that being a vice chair is a great honour until you actually have to chair a meeting, <laughs> and then it becomes it becomes an actual issue. So, um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the. Uh, Doncaster Health and Wellbeing Board and our first meeting of 2023. Um, apologies from uh, Councillor Blake, um, who is who is having some some leave. So I'm the uh, I'm the chair today. My name's Anthony Fitzgerald, and I'm Executive Place Director for South for NHS South Yorkshire. I'm going to go around and ask people to um, to, to to introduce themselves. So uh, Jonathan, would you like to start, please? Good morning, Jonathan Goodrum from the Council's Governance Team. And Richard, if we can um, go your way, please. Good morning, everybody. Richard Parker, Chief Executive, Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Hello, good morning, everybody. Councillor Nigel Ball, Cabinet Member for Public Health, Leisure, Culture and Planning. Morning, I'm Laura Sherbin, I'm Chief Executive of Primary Care, Doncaster. Good morning, Rihanna Nelson, Director of Children's Services. Phil Holmes, Director of Adults, Health and Wellbeing in the Council. Glynis Smith, Hatfield Ward Councillor. Good morning, Cynthia Ransom, Ward Member for Spotborough. Morning, Lucy Robertshaw, Director of Arts and Health at Darts. I'm here to represent the Health and Social Care Forum. Shall I go next? Nabil al Sindi. I'm a GP in the north of Doncaster and Place Medical Director for South Yorkshire ICB. Morning everyone, Emily Adams, uh, Policy Manager at the Council. Uh, Mitch Salter, Senior Policy Manager at the Council. Sorry, Louise Robson, Public Health, Doncaster Council. Good morning, Ruth Bruce, Doncaster Place Development Lead. Morning, Rachel Leslie, Deputy Director of Public Health at Doncaster Council. Good morning, Laura Quinn, Public Health, Doncaster Council. Rupert Zuckerman, Director of Public Health, uh, City of Doncaster Council. Thank you, and uh, welcome, Dave. Um, I'll introduce you, Dave Richmond, the Chief Executive of St Ledger um, Homes. Okay, uh, we've also received apologies as well as um, Councillor Blake from Sheila Lloyd um, at Ardash, Caff Witherington at Voluntary Action Doncaster, and um, Councillor Andrea Robinson. Um, we haven't received any more uh, information in any substitutes attending. Is there any other apologies that people would like to give from colleagues? No. Okay, so we're not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by the way of the fire exit through the doors of the rear of the chamber. When you've left the chamber, please proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there are anyone with uh, mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated at the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is at the public square in front of CAST beyond the fountain. I would like to inform any members of the public and press today that today's meeting will be audio-visually recorded. Uh, by entering the council chamber, you accept that you will be recorded and your images, may be, your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. Thank you very much. So the first item of the agenda is, is Chair's um, announcement, and I've got two. Um, the first will is that members will recall that in June 2022, we received the first annual report of the board, which highlighted the work of the board over the previous 12 months. This is just to give a heads up that Rupert's team will be in touch with board members over the coming weeks, asking you to provide updates on the activities and areas of focus that featured pro 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 prominently in your respective organizations over the past year. Rupert, anything to add to that? No, that's fine. The plan will be that it will come to the first meeting of the new municipal year, which will be June. Thanks. Thanks very much. So if we can all um, participate in that in that exercise. Um, and then indulge me on uh, an announcement myself that um, obviously at the moment our um, health and care services find themselves under significant, um, significant pressure through um, various um, 
perfect storms of um, increased demand and industrial action. And I just wanted to put, put on record my thanks as place director to all the members of staff across our organizations who have worked professionally um, and compassionately um, across some very, very difficult weeks and continue to do so. Thank you. We're on to exclusion of press and public. There are no items on today's agenda where the press and public are to be excluded. So item four, public questions. We have around 15 minutes um, time period for this. Um, this is a standing item on the board's agenda and it's aimed at providing an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question or to make uh, a statement. Are there any uh, elected members or members of the public attending today's meeting who wish to put a question to the board? So I can see a few at the back. I think that's you, Mr. Brown. Do you want, do you want to go first? Fire away. Testing, testing. All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Again, it's with a bit of trepidation that I'm here today um, talking about my lived experiences of racism. I'm born and bred in Doncaster, and uh, I'm a parent. And it's almost heartbreaking having to, year on year, to ask this board to do something to stop the racism that me, my family, and other people experience. The council in, what, 20 years ago, commissioned a Gus John report that highlighted racism in Doncaster. Nothing was done about it. A council officer called Nadine Matuja articulated racism, received a payoff, nothing was done about it. More, more recently, we've seen an Ofsted report that talks about looked after children's, their ethnicity not being recorded. That's something that we articulated 20 years ago. I'm in a situation whereby, and I'm luckier than most, Whilst I have subjected to racism, I work in the NHS. My family work in the NHS. I don't understand why it is that I've got to come here year on year to talk about our experiences and ask for it to stop. My sister is a senior midwife at the hospital. She's putting herself at risk going in on Christmas Day to deliver babies, and yet we cannot even have our say on something called the Wellbeing, um, sorry, the Wellbeing and Inclusion Commission, or whatever it is, we can't have our say. We've had the Ofsted report, we put forward suggestions, ideas, we can't have our say. I just would like to know why is it that people who are interested people like me who take time to come here year after year we're always excluded we can't have our say why is that why is that somebody please tell me right as i say i we want to move forward i'm now lucky that despite the racisms and the barriers my son is now working in london as an investment banker. The same son who was told that he could not even apply for a job at Doncaster Council because he had no council experience. That's our lived experiences. Why is it that he can work for an investment banker in the city of London and yet he can't even apply for a job where he lives, right? My daughter has recently, um, been selected to play netball for England, 
great achievement while studying at Loughborough University. So I'd just like this false narrative about myself and black people to stop. Despite all the barriers, we're not going to let the racism stop us. And in conclusion, Chair, right, my ask is we're coming up now to the Windrush generation, 75, 75 years um, our parents first arrived into England, once again subjected to no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, etc. I stand here today on their shoulders. My dad has passed away, sadly, right? But I don't know what this board is doing to comm commemorate the contributions of people who look like me, who have worked in the NHS, who have sacrificed their times, their lives, and give so much to the NHS. As I say, my family members were working on Christmas Day, and yet they've been subjected to the indignities of not even being listened to or even to have their say. You know, we know if you're a black woman, you're four times more likely to die during pregnancy. And yet, my sister, who's a senior midwife, we can't even make a contribution to look at those kind of inequalities simply because we're black. Why is that? It's upsetting. You can see in my emotions that it's very, very unsetting. Upsetting. So just want to know what are we going to do in relation to Windrush generation. I'm happy to support, I'm happy to help. Um, and Mr. Gavin Ball and the mayor, regional mayor of Doncaster, regional mayor of the city region, they agreed at the integrated care board that they would apply an anti-racist lens. I think Dr. Rupert Suckling will agree, I think he was at that meeting, he would, that they would apply an anti-racist lens to tackling health inequalities and that they would create a psychological safe space for people like me to have our say. Now, that happened, I think, Rupert, in October, here we are in January 2023. I'd like to know what does that look like so that I feel safe, right? No disrespect to the people in this room, but I want a safe environment where people like me, people who are interested, can just simply have our say. We've got a lot to give. I'm privileged to be reverse mentoring a senior leader in the NHS. I would encourage as well that people in this room, people who feel a little bit uncomfortable about what I'm talking about, takes advantage of some kind of reverse mentoring that is available. Uh, Professor Stacy Johnson is leading that piece of work and I can connect you to that. But as I say, sorry Chair for being a little bit emotional, no. but I, I would just like the racism to stop. Okay, please don't apologise. Thank you um, for, for, for your statement. Um, there's, there's a lot in there, Mr Brown isn't there, and I can speak personally as a, an employee of um, NHS South Yorkshire that there is very much the commitment from, um, from uh, Gavin Boyle and, and, uh, and the new organisation around uh, uh, anti-racism uh, stance, and I'm sure that'll be shared by all the organisations um, in this room. There were uh, just a couple of things that I pulled out of that statement, if, if I can. The um, involvement in the Fairness and Inclusion um, Commission, then, Rupert, that will obviously be a key part of the work that we're doing. Yep, so uh, the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission begins in uh, January, and we've asked for uh, nominations from the minority partnership board but we've also got a mechanism for all people to put their voices into that uh, commission but i've put my name forward for that and nobody's come back to me so you know come on let's not keep on insulting me you know i've put my name forward i've put suggestions forward and nobody's come back to me that's the truth and i'm also aware that you haven't signed the uh, uh, code of conduct for the minority partnership board, and I don't know whether that's a reason why you've not your name hasn't made it forward either. Okay, okay, T Tim. So we'll, Mr. Brown, we'll take that out of here, and we'll make sure that that that, that, that that's looked at. Um, 
In terms of the re reverse uh, mentoring, I've heard some good reports of, uh, of, of that programme and um, so, some, 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 some good success of that. So thanks for mentioning that, Mr Brown, and we, we are um, promoting that across the, all of our organisations as a, a good forum for the right um, conversations to take place. Um, Richard. Yeah, just to confirm um, um, that um, the Teaching Trust has had a reverse mentoring programme for a couple of years and um, the vast majority of the executive directors have uh, undertaken that program um, the first um, period was reviewed with the idea obviously of improving over time we would also confirm that we've undertaken significant work prior to and during um, the covid pandemic which has been quite disruptive in a number of ways in terms of making progress on these matters with um, carl george who was developing from work that he'd undertaken nationally and with Birmingham uh, Race Action Composition and Education Code. And um, our organisation was one of the first, if not the first, um, NHS Trust in the country to work with um, Dr George on those matters. And certainly um, these sorts of issues are a, a real passion of our chair, um, who, who's actively involved in a number of ways in, in these programmes. As an organisation, we've also supported the Breaking Through programme that was prior to COVID, which the NHS England and NHSI were um, using as a vehicle to fast track, if you want, candidates from um, BAME backgrounds to higher senior management posts within the NHS, which is work that we would uh, continue with. And we also, as organisations, and I think as places and um, in support of the ICB, been building on and using some of the work in Calderdale and Huddersfield that was looking about whether there was any issues related to waiting times and other matters which is partly related to your comment um miss brown about um the maternity figures and the um the quote about being four times more likely to have um a, a significant or, or die during pregnancy which is matters that as a trust stand also as a an icb we're well cited on in terms of what actions we could take to look to how we might influence and reduce those rates over time and certainly as an organization we would be inclusive with anyone who's got experience through maternity voices partnership or otherwise in, in getting involved in that work to make sure that we are covering all of the important matters so that uh, over time um, everybody gets the service that they require and deserve um, irrespective of any characteristics and certainly I would put on record that's the aim of our organisation. Thank you very much. Um, the final thing I'll say on on this is that uh, members will remember last time we had some health inequality um, presentations didn't we and we committed to um, to, to extending training to um, non-executive um, members across uh, all our organisations on health inequalities. And I know Mandy Espy, as a result of the meeting last time, is putting that into, into place. So thank you, uh, th thank you, Mr Brown, for, for, for that statement, and we'll take actions accordingly. Now, I think we had another question at the back. Go good morning. Do you, do you want to just um, uh, introduce yourself, please, and um, we'll work the technology so we can hear you. Yeah. I've got quite a loud voice anyway, but I'll, I'll use the microphone just to, so I don't have to shout. Um, thank you for letting me present today. Um, I will apologise in advance because this is rather long. It might not be as long as yours and maybe not quite as important to some degree, but um, it is quite a, a, a long uh, story. Um, I talk about uh, the primary health care networks that have been put in place for the last couple of years. And the one that I'm referring to is the one in the north, where there's about nine practices um, collaborating across uh, each of the across the, that area of the north with um, basically the idea is and I think it's, it sounds like in principle it sounds a wonderful idea where you have shared resources so if one practice has a podiatrist other other practices can uh, refer into that that area so all the, the patients in that area have the same access to the same facilities so in principle um, I think it's great um, my uh, experience uh, with the, with our GP up until COVID had been absolutely fantastic. Been there for 30 years, basically. Uh, fantastic practice. However, in the last 18 months, 
as most people, and I, I will get emotional, so you'll have to forgive me. I've tried not to be. In the last 18 months, um, obviously everybody's kept away from the GPs as much as they possibly can because of COVID. My uh, husband is uh, severely disabled. Um, God willing, touch wood, he'll touch 80 next month. So he has very complicated, and as, as a result of the last couple of years, very complicated medical history. So he's had a heart attack a number of years ago on blood thinners, which obviously has its own impact. He had a, a, an accident when he was 21, which meant that um, he broke his pelvis and lost a hip. It just disappeared. That was a long time ago. Obviously, today's technology would mean that that would be tr treated differently. As a result, what he ended up with was he had to have a new knee because of the impact of how he walked. He had a raised shoe, which was like four or five inches on, on the, the bad leg, which obviously then meant that the spine twisted. So that meant several operations. One was to have um, a hip replaced, and it wasn't a replacement, it was a reconstruction because there was no hip there. There was no ball and socket. He then had to have several, I think about 30 hours of surgery on his spine to put cages in and a tripod in to hold everything up on the, in his pelvis. As a, as a, <laughs> as a lucky wee soul, uh, he then ended up with throat cancer. And we're in the middle of getting that treated through COVID. Um, before uh, COVID started, we had an eye test and they had, they had to start of a cataract. During COVID, we just thought that this was the cataract acting up because he was losing the sight in that eye. Turned out he had a very rare eye cancer. So that started another set of rules, another set of diagnostics off and treatment. In the last six months, um, he has, well, April, uh, he was in a lot of pain. So we're back to the hospital with his spinal surgery with regards to trying to manage this pain in his spine. And he hasn't seen a GP in years. He hasn't had any um, well men clinics, blood pressure taking, um, any, anything at all. So he rang the GP and said, is it possible to have um, my PSA levels checked? I haven't had it checked for years. As you can imagine, there was a reason for that, why I asked that question. As a result of the PSA levels that were through the roof, which set on at the same time, another set of diagnostic tests. So he now has prostate cancer, which has metastasized. So in all of this, my point is, he hasn't seen a GP. Not one person has rung up and said, how is he? Our GP told him the results that he might have prostate cancer on the phone. On top of that, we had an armed robbery at the house uh, with acid threatened to be thrown in our face, etc., etc. So sleeping and um, it's not it's not easy. Robin then had because he hasn't got any feeling or very little feeling and um, circulation in his feet as a result of all the operations, he's got a lack of nerve sensation and a dropped foot. He ended up with um, a huge sore about the size of an egg on the bottom and the side of his foot. The doctor didn't see that either, just referred him straight to the, to the podiatrist because they were frightened in case it turned out and to be a, a, a big ulcer that couldn't be treated. So this is just in the last 18 months, right? Neither myself or my husband has seen a GP. And I put it to the board that that is not acceptable. I've tried um, ringing, I've, I do, touch wood, fortunately, um, I'm not a frequent flyer to the GP or, or for anything. It's just as blinking well, I think, don't you? <laughs> I think Robin's having my share of the NHS's benefits. Um, but um, I actually rang up, uh, I got an, uh, a text, uh, and this again is from the health board. Uh, I can't say for definite if it was from the practice or it's a general um, sort of call centre type of text saying that... Uh, Guidelines suggest that people of a certain age, they had the blood pressure checked every five years. Well, clearly I haven't had mine done. One would expect that the next line would say, go to make an appointment with your GPs to have your blood pressure checked. 
what it did say was to buy a machine, to go online and buy a machine to do your own blood pressure. That was the first instance. The second example was to go to the pharmacy to get it done, and the third was to go to the GP. Now, in my opinion, right, and I think in most people's opinion, that would be the other way around, would be the recommendation. I do understand that if you've got medical conditions and you need to monitor your blood pressure, it is ad advantageous to have one of those machines to do it yourself on a regular basis. I don't think it should be the first option for a patient who's never had their blood pressure taken probably in 10 years. Now, I speak not only on my own personal uh, experiences, but as the Joint Rural Parishes, I chair the Joint Rural Parishes, which represent 16 parishes and communities in the Sprott Reward. A few of the other examples, and I won't go into any detail with these, I will just highlight these. So nobody is able to get an appointment with a GP. I don't care what you're all saying and what, what is being told to the public. When the public and the patients are trying to get an appointment, it's impossible. A lady rang up, and I know this firsthand, rang up about conjunctivitis. So she was told there was no appointments to go to accident and emergency. With conjunctivitis, really? All you need to do is boil some water and put some salt in and bathe your eyes. That is basic nursing or common sense. But a lot of people I do understand have not been given these common sense uh, remedies, I'll say, to rectify it. But to, to advocate that they go to accident and emergency, I'm sorry, board, when accident and emergency is on its knees and it's like a war zone, I don't think that's appropriate. A lady in heart failure, they didn't even have it in her notes. Who told you you had heart failure? The consultant had written and told the GP that she had heart failure. She was struggling to breathe. She obviously had an infection. She had fluid in her lungs. And as a lay person, I, even I know what that looks like. She was told instead of getting a, a, an antibiotic to go to accident and emergency. Uh, hormone replacement, they gave the... She'd had a, a, a conversation with the GP. They, they agreed a way forward in a plan. And on that plan, unfortunately, the, the, what, what she actually collected from the, the pharmacist was, was a different prescription to what was agreed. Trying to get that rectified, she was told there wasn't an appointment. She had to go to accident emergency to get it rectified. Okay. Those are just three. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, right, is with regards to the primary core network i've actually read the 104 page contract that the that all the individual practices have signed up to and the conditions that they are supposed to adhere to i know from my practice chair that one of the the conditions is that they are out of our appointments there is no it is not on our website it is not in our waiting area and even if it was in the waiting area, there are so few patients that are getting into the waiting area to see a, a GP that it, it's irrelevant. It's not being advertised and, and advocated and promoted on the desk by the receptionist. And as I speak to a number of other people um, in different GP surgeries, it's exactly the same there. So my question to the board is really, in principle, right, the sharing of uh, health service across the, the estate of the north. In principle, it's a great idea. But my question is, who is monitoring and checking to, to ensure that these conditions are being met? And, you know, do you do something like a mystery shopper as a patient to these practices to see whether, you know, what, what, what is, how, how are you actually getting an appointment and are you offered all these things? So okay. that, are my, that are my two things, Chair. Thank you very much. And um, is it Mrs. Is it Mrs. Job? Sorry, I should have said yeah. it's Rhonda Job. Yes, it is, Mrs. Rhonda, Job. Rhonda, thanks yeah. for coming in, um, and my um, sympathies to, to yourself over the last eighteen months and your husband, um, Robin. I know it must be a very difficult time for you at the moment, and um, certainly the best wishes over the next uh, over the next course of, of treatment for that. Um, thank you for coming and, and telling that, and um, it was quite a personal story, but also bringing the reflections of, 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 of people that you've talked to as well. I've pulled out, before you asked that last question, I had pulled out a general theme, really, around GP access, communication, um, and something in there around um, 
blood pressure that we might that we might pick up as well really but really i think the crux of your question is around access it's around enhanced access out of hours etc and also how we check as a system that that's being utilized yeah. uh, uh, as well well we have various experts in the, in the in the room on this including the gp from the north of doncaster um so um nabil do you just want to start and then um other people may want to come in yeah, um, so Ron does it. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think it's a really helpful set of observations. So, and I'm sure if we spoke to you know the whole of Doncaster population, we'd have a, a significant portion who have had similar experiences over the last two years. I don't think anyone is going to pretend, you know, and the general practice side, the pharmacy side, and, and probably our you know acute and community trust colleagues that the service we've been able to provide through the pandemic is 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 enough. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that that we obviously can't go into yep. today. Um, I think the things that obviously, you know, when you talk about your husband first in a really complicated case, I think those are the people who probably have missed out the most because when when you've got services already under strain, it's generally the vulnerable who find it hardest to get into that limited capacity, particularly if practices are working <coughs> on that model that you have to ring first thing in the morning, they can't book things in advance. It's not all practices, and I can say that honestly, as my practice doesn't have just that model, but it is, it is, it is a significant yeah. number of practices um, who, who, who do that. Yeah. And I think, I think we'd all sort of acknowledge that the care that's provided to everyone hasn't been as good as we would like it to be. It, for me, it's not necessarily, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. fortunate enough that yeah. I can speak up for myself. Yeah. As, uh, hence why I'm here, exactly. I, and not just speaking up for me, but speaking up for other patients and residents who've contacted me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not really, I don't really want to sort of um, dwell on my no, particular no. instance. I think what I'm trying to get yeah. across is that is one complicated instance where it's gone on quite repeatedly yeah. and it hasn't been rectified. But there are, as you've said yourself, yeah. there are lots of instances where people are being let down. Mm -hmm. On on the, I, I feel sometimes that the system that you've got in place is more for uh, the practice support staff as opposed to what's beneficial to the patient, what the patient needs. And at the end of the day, fundamentally, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, the NHS is a service for the patients. And I think it's the other way around at the minute. It's it seems to be on the wrong foot. Thank you. So I just keep going. On, yep. A, a yep. Um, so again, I, I hear that, and I think a lot of people would share um, would, would share that view. And I think part of it is because there is a limited, a finite resource. So even with the extra staff that the primary care networks have brought in, so you mentioned the podiatrist yeah. we have, we've got a physio yeah. as well, we've got a, a whole pharmacy team now that we didn't have three or four years ago. They are still saturated, so it's not like there is that. And so we, we have to work as practice to try and as best we can get people to the right part of the system within our practice within those bigger teams as well. Okay. And then where appropriate into the urgent care system mm. and things. And, and, and for me, the, the bits that jumped out really is where it's not working is, is when with those low level things like conjunctivitis, you said, if, if that, you know, they're told to go to A&E rather than the community pharmacy who we commission as an ICB to, to deliver um, things like that. There's yeah. also a minor eye care service that we provide to so people can go to the opticians and have those simple things um, done for them as well so so that clearly hasn't worked you would hope that because of the system that's in place at the acute trust that once they turned up to that front door triage at a and e they would quickly have been diverted back to the um at least the gp element of what's available there but that's still not an ideal journey for um for anyone i think there's also an opportunity um if i think about i've been involved heavily with um generations who have lost out on say learning to cook at school well, there is a similarity here in as much as you know grannies who used to pass on the the, the easy remedies that's been i think there's a gap there somewhere mm -hmm. yeah. and i think there's a bit of education perhaps where the public needs to sort of learn from an older person let's say or an experienced person or even a district nurse or mm -hmm. we need to do some sort of community yep. work to sort of to come up with these easy remedies that they don't need to go yep. to the gp for definitely and i, th I think self-care and pulling on those community assets mm. is a key bit because even you know if things ease over the next year or two and there's a bit of a debate whether that will be the case or not there probably still isn't capacity within the core health services yep. to deal with all those yep. health and health related needs yep. So we're going to have to maximise sort of community assets 
mm. and that kind of thing. And I think we talked lots of time about education as well, yeah. getting in, yeah. into schools. Um, but there are, I was going to say, last thing, there are elements of that happening, particularly with um, uh, sort of community hubs as well, trying yeah. to bring together sort yeah. of midwives. I must admit, health I, ha I haven't in, seen in any of that in the hubs yet. Mm. Uh, mm. It may have not filtered down because I am well aware of that, but I haven't seen that yet. But yeah. I think this is another thing in terms of education and training. Yeah. M my my thing really was about um, the conditions yeah. that, that that are in mm -hmm. the, the contract. Is anyone checking? Is anybody yeah. monitoring? R Rhonda, shall I, shall, shall I uh, address that point? Yeah, so, sure. um, yes, is answer to, you, to, to to your question. We do um, we look at a, a series of uh, both qualitative and quantitative indicators for primary care, including utilization of the additional capacity that we put on weekend um, um, e evening uh, primary care appointments but also um, patient feedback you, you, you know we, we 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 look a lot at the surveys for, um, from primary care but also through our work of our patient participation um, groups now Rhonda I've heard the stories um, that, that you've described, so I, so I don't want you to feel that we that that, that we aren't on as mm. the one of the main priorities for Doncaster Place at the moment is around access to to, to primary care, and you know that is a, that is a national issue, but that's that's not to excuse the the work that we're looking at, which is use of multiple multiple professionals such as Dr. Al Cindy um, um, describes different way of providing appointments such as telephone appointments digital digital etc and then also use of additional ca um, capacity which of course is wider than an appointment with your but with, with, yeah. with your GP practice so I, I will have to bring this to an end but yes, I, I just want to say a couple of things the first thing is I'm happy to continue this d d dialogue um, with you with, with you mrs. Joe in terms of demonstrating more the work that we're doing and we're happy to bring back more primary care um, work here to a health and wellbeing board, but to the health and wellbeing board, because it is one of the key priorities, and you're not alone in in, in expressing some of the frustrations. So, as Thank I say, you. good luck to yourself and um, and, and 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 your um, you. and and Steve, do you just want to add to that? Yeah, just just briefly, I'm from Healthwatch Doncaster. We facilitate the patient participation group uh, for the whole of Doncaster. Please get in touch with us. We'll put you in touch with your local P PG, your patient participation group. If you actually want to, to, to go along to that, you can actually directly express that, usually to a practice manager, and, and get your personal issues directly to somebody. Funny enough, the I did that last night. Okay. <laughs> the, other, the other thing you can do is express your opinion uh, on Care Opinion. Uh, I don't know what that is. Care Opinion is a website where uh, members of the public can... Uh, give good or bad reviews for the health and care services that they're receiving. They're coordinated and correlated and we look at them as Health Watch and that's our primary source of information for what we look into in regards to health and social care for people of Doncaster. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank just one thing, Chair, sorry, I do apologise. You, you talked about quality and quantitative. Is that just data or do you physically check, i.e. do you mystery shop? in any way, shape or form, or do you just rely on data? Um, hmm. Probably more a data um, approach, although Dr. Al Cindy did uh, some more mystery shopping, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I guess it's hard to mystery shop for official services. You need, obviously, NHS numbers and to call, you know, perhaps need to bring up your record <clears throat> at that time. So, um, you know, we, we have times, like I have with the pressures gone and spent a bit of time working in urgent care and at the out of hours service just to see actually who is rocking up, what are they yes. saying about you? And I, you know, again, um, similar story. Um, our t primary care team do, on a semi-regular basis, ring round um, practices and do some stuff around access, but they couldn't go in and pretend to be a patient because that's just not how the, um, we can the systems yeah. work. Yeah. We could. Okay. okay so okay, there's some you. there's some conversations to continue. Thank you so much for, for, for your experiences and your questions and there's some work to take out thank you okay, for your thank time you. thank you very much thank you i know that's taken longer than we normally have but there were two important very important issues i've just got one more um question that we've had a written um written question on behalf of mr wayne goddard on behalf of the dementia doncaster dementia collaborative who is unable to attend today's meeting in person his question is based on current data and captured lived experience of people affected by dementia living in Doncaster. It is clear that the position has in fact deteriorated and not improved since our question was discussed at the Health and Wellbeing Board in June 2021. Can the Health and Wellbeing Board explain what is being done to address this declining um, position? 
We've had a joint response from NHS um, South Yorkshire and the local authority in relation to dementia question to the Health and Wellbeing Board, and I will read that now. The strategy which is currently in development is much broader than the current procurement process, which includes the pre- and post-diagnostic service and the community therapy services. The strategy will be developed jointly with partners and is not just about commission services, but how dementia impacts Doncaster across several pathways and how we can set out actions to improve it. The decision to take a full procurement exercise for these services was made in 2020 to ensure procurement law was adhered to and all providers were made aware of this decision. The development of a dementia strategy was agreed by partners and it is encompassed in the Aging Well Delivery Plan in 2021. And we have a development group established um, thereafter. In regards to the engagement work that was commissioned, um, Health, um, and Healthwatch undertake, undertook the engagement across uh, Doncaster. The Dementia Deep Dive, which was un undertaken in November 2019, was also a significant piece of engagement work. In addition to ongoing feedback from people with dementia and their carers and other stakeholders, engagement with the Dementia Collaborative and these two significant pieces of work demonstrate intense engagement throughout and has informed and, sh and shaped the specifications. People with lived experience have evaluated both elements of the dementia service and the specifications allowed for the development of co-producing the offer. We can confirm that the procurement is now closed, but no award has been made for either element of the service. It is the intention that further procurement will be undertaken in, a, in early 2023. In relation to the data that Mr Goddard um, mentions, the dashboard has only recently been updated. The reduction in rates in several areas has, has been significantly impacted by the COVID pandemic. And every effort has been made with providers during, dur, during, through the Accountable Care Partnership meetings to engage them in wider work that's happening across Doncaster. Some are now engaging with the locality work and a lot of effort has gone into producing, co-producing dementia pages on Your Life Doncaster for people with lived experience. We are working with providers to implement actions linked to winter and cost of living crisis alongside immediate actions to improve service, the service based on the findings of the inside um, report. Broadly summarising a whole host of actions there uh, to, to, uh, to, address, um, to address the dementia um, situ situation that Mr Goddard um, describes. Um, anything to add to that, Rupert? Oh, sorry, Lucy, hi. Mm. I do think it's slightly worrying. I'm just talking from a community and voluntary service point of view, is that um, a number of us were involved in going for the procurement for the community therapy tender and the other one. And obviously that has been closed without anything being awarded, but with no real sense as to why, what was missing, what happens next, and any kind of sort of deadline. So there's a worry there, I think, from us in terms of and the other voluntary and community sectors as to, you know, what is actually being delivered and you know we're all ready to go so I know there's going to be some marketplace events going on I think in February they've said um, but there is clearly a bit of a delay there so there's something that's gone a little bit wrong there with procurement so I suppose it's more sort of general point about the three questions that we've had so obviously uh, Rhonda was here earlier with her sort of lived um, experience Mr Brown um, uh, was here at the start and then that sort of question also is about lived experience and I wonder whether we ought to actually think about those three sort of items you know uh, sort of you know inequalities particularly ethnic inequalities uh, primary care and then dementia to actually think about how we put those on the agenda and we can have a session where a longer session where it's actually led by people with the lived experience because it feels a bit at the moment as though we've got lived experience and we've got answers and they're not quite sort of we're not quite getting the right yeah. understanding we're not able to yeah. resolve the problem so I know Mr Brown said you know I think I can't remember how many years you've been coming to the health and wellbeing board Mr Brown but you know we're not we don't seem able to move forward and I think we need to think about how we can move this uh, forward so I'm happy to take that away and speak to Rachel Blake the chair yeah. about how we might try and program those three elements in probably they'll need a you know a longer session you know a dedicated session for each of those items um, but also so that people you know can who are on the board can also be there um, but it's about getting to the root of, the, of what the problems are really yeah. rather than 
lived experience just meeting with a auntie that says, well, there's a lot happening, mm -hmm. which obviously isn't um, yeah. getting us any progress. Th th thanks, Rupert. I think that would be hugely beneficial. And as we said at the beginning, you're going to be in contact with all organisations, aren't you, about, um, about providing updates on activities and areas of focus over the over last year there might be a theme in there about how we're capturing the lived experience and and and, and feeding back accordingly um and involving that with our work as well so perhaps that might be a theme with the organizations that bring out so there's a couple of actions i think for us there jonathan lucy sorry just a quick one um is it possible to have a th we're talking about those three main areas there but i think the area that always gets missed is learning disability and if you look at the health inequalities of people with learning disabilities the reduction in life expectancy the ability to be able to actually get through to a doctor and explain what's wrong we talked over there the lady there talked about being able to you know if you're there and you're articulate and you know what you're doing but but actually you know if we're talking about adults or you know people with learning disabilities um, I think it's an area that always gets missed. Thanks. Yeah, Rupert. Just on the, you know, happy in principle, I know learning disabilities has been through scrutiny um, uh, process as well, and they actually did something very similar. I think Phil, you were involved in that. Phil, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, Lucy, people with a learning disability can be pretty disenfranchised and, and, you know, there, there are a number of cohorts of people, so we've had three discussed today. There are other, and a lot of these things cross-cut as well, don't they? So people with a learning disability from a black, black and minority ethnic background are probably even more disenfranchised than some other people with a learning disability. Um, there is, in terms of learning disability, because we agreed a partnership strategy around learning disability and for autistic people, we do go to... Um, uh, we do publicly account for that, and we do that via the... Um, by the scrutiny commission, so we talk, we, we we launch the strategy, and then we come with progress, and we try to bring people with lived experience who can, rather than us painting it better than it is, who can say how it feels for them. So we can. There's no reason why this board can't take an interest in that also. But probably maybe a learning disability and autism is something we've got a little bit of that going. I was just going to say, chair, while I've got the floor, I think one of the other things that feels key to me is, um, so arranging sessions in this group as Rupert said feels like a good idea but I think we have to be assured that the right co-production is happening in these work streams so if primary care is primarily data driven there's probably more we need to do for co-production to be there Rupert was talking about some co-production around black and minority ethnic and, and, a, and a, a framework for doing that but it's sounding like we're not that clear on dementia either how that's happening so we probably need to make sure that we chat otherwise we'll do a really good session here that we'll, we'll, feel, we'll feel sure about, but actually back at the ranch in these work streams, things will start to dissipate again if we haven't got people who lived experience central in the work. Thanks, Phil. I think it's a really, really important point, and I think it's a, a sense check that we all need to take as organisations through the priorities um, that we've got, so we, we, we can definitely go away and, and do that. Um, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it builds, I think, on a couple of the points because um, one of the things that we're probably not being good at is um, explaining to people how services did and have changed during the pandemic and um, and expectations and matching expectations to the reality of delivery because personally I don't think we're ever going to go back to the model that was pre-pandemic in terms of the way in which people access or were provided with healthcare because the pandemic has done a number of things, which is also change demand. And I think as a result of some of the changes, we've seen demand change and we've seen demand increase. So if you take my organization, we saw 10% more patients in December than in the previous years ever. And we had 10% more admissions. And as a result of that, the system has to gear up to respond to the demand. And actually, I think in general practice, some of the things that general practice did to respond to the pandemic. So for instance, mobilizing a vaccination program that vaccinated millions of people that has been so effective in preventing severe um, illness in, in huge groups of people meant that general practice couldn't deal with some of the issues in the contract, which when um, the audience member touched upon uh, the quaff outcomes because actually the resources had to be diverted to the priority at the time. So as we learn about what's needed now, we obviously have got the process of change. And so some of the services also provide uh, completely different than they did when 
you know, perhaps I was a child or others were children in terms of conjunctivitis, um, maybe classed as a, a, you know, a minor illness, but unless you establish the cause of conjunctivitis, you might be treating exactly the wrong thing. So we will have to communicate with our public in terms of accessing the right people at the right time to produce the right results so that services are geared to um, the need. And I think touching on some of the points about um, our population, what we already know and what we're already doing work on is that <clears throat> the most deprived areas of Doncaster, and in fact any um, council area, actually access emergency care significantly more than the less deprived other affluent areas who access planned um, care. And that's one of the inequalities we've got to tackle because the outcomes from doing that are worse. And so what we've got to do is work with our communities to make sure that they access the right service at the right time to get the right result. And actually that has changed during the pandemic because a number of people didn't access services at all. And as a result of that, their disease processes or morbidities are two years on, which basically means they're much more complex, much more um, uh, input in terms of diagnosis and treatment takes place, which is a change demand. And I don't think you know, locally, nationally, we've been very good at explaining that because um, actually people perceive that the demand is the same and the resources are the same, therefore I should be able to access my GP as I did before the pandemic. And actually I don't think we'll ever have the same or similar services. What we've got to do is have services that are high quality and fit for purpose, but they may be different. And if we don't start talking about how they're different and actually what we can and can't provide, we will end up with this um, perception uh, that the public have of the services and a mismatch between the two that in essence causes anxiety and stress and concern. And I think we could address some of them by the sessions being more focused on you know, what we are doing, what is in place, what we're working on, because that might give some reassurance to our public that we do understand the problems and we are trying to tackle them and we're trying to tackle them as quickly as possible. But actually with more demand, there is this bit that services have to change or if they don't change, we want to provide them in, a diff in the same way the resources have to increase significantly. And I think that's what we're wrestling with, you know, as I said, locally, uh, regionally, and as a country. Yeah. Um, couldn't agree more, actually. Um, I, I, think, I think what we're talking about is a realistic and informed conversation with our public and our residents, uh, do, uh, aren't we? Do, 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 you want to, do you want to come in there, Councillor Baldwin? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's similar, obviously, Anthony, to what we were discussing yesterday, because to me, you know, there has clearly, and Richard's highlighted it, you know, um, quite well in terms of the, the change since sort of like post-pandemic in terms of accessing services. From, from, from my side, though, um, as a councillor, but also somebody who represents my communities, I think that there's, that there's almost like a level of confusion, um, certainly coming from residents in terms of how to access services and what services are available. So some of it is down to the, the communication of that. So, so to me, you know, um, I mean, I used to work in IAG, but I think it's an IAG issue, if I'm perfectly honest. When you ring up a surgery, and we know that there's issues with telephony in terms of actually getting through, but once you actually get through to somebody, it's about making sure that individual is, is not just administrial based, but effectively it provides a hotline in terms of that information, advice and guidance that can be passed on to, to, to residents that are ringing up for services. So whether it's somebody who needs a blood pressure check or that, you know, maybe they need something else in terms of another service or podiatry or anything like that, that person on the end of the phone is suitably qualified to be able to deal with those queries. At the moment, I don't think that that exists. I think that, that and that's no disrespect to them, by the way, but I think it's around signposting and referral, an effective signposting and referral in terms of those services. And I think that, you know, when, when you go through that process, um, you'll find that that will aid your culture shift because effectively what you've got is a, it's almost like it's a twin culture shift within your services and how you're, you're developing those and moving forward with the fact that you don't always have to see a GP. But it's also a, a culture shift that's needed within our communities and with our people to say that actually, do I need to see a doctor for this? Will I get better services down at the pharmacy? Will I will I be able to see um, a nurse within you know um, within the, the the surgery to actually deal with something? So to me, it's that culture shift that, that that's organisational, but it's also the culture shift within our communities. But the only thing that will aid that is having primarily up to date, clear IAG at the point of contact. 
Thank you. The um, wasn't necessarily where these questions were <laughs> going to take us. Um, thanks, Mr. Brown, but but it but it will be. Um, I think it's been a helpful conversation, Rupert, and there's some things that we can definitely take out as themes of this um, uh, around lived experience, around a grown-up and informed conversation with our public, and about better signposting and communication with them about what the, o the offers are there. I'm going to bring this part of the section to a close, but thank everybody for their contributions. Um, just to end, Jonathan, a copy of the response around the dementia will be sent to Mr. Goddard after today's meeting. Um, okay, item five, declarations of interest. Um, does anybody have a, um, a disclosable interest or any other interest to declare in relation to the business on today's agenda? No, thank you. Um, minutes of the Health and Wellbeing meeting on the 10th of November. Um, they're attached on page one of the agenda's papers. Board is asked to consider and prove these as a correct record. Can we agree the meetings as a true and accurate record? Thank you very much. So what are we actually doing about things then? So item number seven, South Yorkshire Integrated um, Care Strategy. Dr. Rupert Suckling, the Director of Public Health, will introduce this item, um, which presents the latest draft of the South Yorkshire Integrated Care Partnerships Integrated Care Strategy for the Board's consideration. And the papers are included in the agenda pack 7 to 78. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I mean, it uh, might feel a bit different going from that sort of conversation we've just had about lived experience into the strategy. So I'll, I'll just give you a bit of background around the strategy. And I think then a lot of the conversation we want to have is about what we might actually do with this and what we're going to be expected to, to do with this. So um, as you know, as a result of the recent changes to the NHS, uh, we've formed a South Yorkshire Integrated Care Partnership, and that had its first meeting in September uh, last year. Um, each uh, it's a partnership between the uh, integrated care board at South Yorkshire and the four uh, local authorities and as a health and wellbeing board we were asked to identify five nominations for that integrated care uh, partnership and they are um, myself councillor Blake who's the chair uh, councillor Ball uh, Dolly Aguru from the inclusion and fairness uh, Forum and Damien Allen, who's the Chief Executive of the Council. Um, there's still, I think, uh, ongoing sort of look at that membership and have we got the right uh, people, and particularly across the whole of South Yorkshire, we've we got the right expertise. So, in particular, uh, Rihanna, there's been conversations about have we got um, uh, people on, the, on that partnership who've got experience around uh, children and children's issues, for instance. Uh, one of the tasks of the Integrated Care Partnership has been to uh, develop a strategy and in a um, you know, fairly uh, ridiculous timescale, if I'm honest, to develop a strategy uh, within three months. So a lot of the conversations we've had at an Integrated Care Partnership have been, well, how can we make a start on what a strategy looks like, bearing in mind that none of us have done the amount of uh, communication, engagement, it, or dare I even say co-production as we would want to to do. Um, so what we've uh, done in terms of uh, developing the strategy to date, and this is the version that's currently out for uh, consultation, is four sort of key things. So the first thing that happened was there was a refresh of the South Yorkshire Population of Health Needs Assessment, looking at what some of the key, key trends are. And um, may not be surprising, but a lot of South Yorkshire is very similar to Doncaster in terms of we've seen stalling life expectancy, reducing healthy life expectancy, um, and uh, particularly increased demands on services, as uh, Richard said, but if you look at uh, children in care, uh, child protection plans, the numbers of people there are, are going up. So we've got that data. We've also looked at some insights from public and patients and we did that through uh, looking at existing uh, engagement that partners have done, particularly over the last couple of years. There was a campaign that was run across South Yorkshire asking people what matters to you about your health and well-being. And then there was some more focus group uh, work done um, with people from seldom heard groups and with people with lived experience. And I know uh, some of the health watches and the third sector organisations were involved in that. The key things interesting that came out of that, maybe not surprising given that last conversation uh, we had were about awareness. 
so what is out there in terms of services, uh, access, and we access them, and can we get better access to them? And uh, also about uh, something that was termed sort of agency, but primarily how do we take more control of our own health and how can you support us to, to do that? The other thing that uh, we did uh, in terms of developing the strategy was to build on existing plans. So in particular for Doncaster, the existing health and wellbeing strategy was uh, looked at and the Doncaster Place plan. And then there were a couple of workshops that were done with the IC, the Integrated Care Partnership uh, partners over October, November, and then into December to develop the, uh, the strategy. And probably the, the key thing to focus on at this stage is uh, what's on uh, page 11, which is the plan on the page. And what this does is look at a set of uh, a, a mission, some goals, some shared outcomes and bold ambitions, and then in particular, some joint commitments. So the sort of four key uh, sort of shared outcomes that we think are important over the next uh, 10 years are about children having the best start in life so that all children are, are ready for, uh, for school. The second one is to support people to live healthier and longer lives and improve the well-being for those in the greatest need. Third one is to develop and support safer and more stronger and more vibrant communities. And then finally, to uh, see people with the skills and resources that they need to, to thrive. And I suppose the challenge that the Integrated Care Partnership will be is sort of working through now is how those outcomes uh, and ambitions get translated through those joint commitments, given that places like Doncaster are already doing work on some of those, and how can they add value at a, a, a South Yorkshire uh, level? Uh, I know that that strategy has been to the Integrated Care Board, into some of the public uh, domains. My understanding in terms of next steps is once all the feedback has been collated, we'll be asked to endorse the strategy as a board and it's also likely to go to cabinet uh, as well uh, from a council perspective for endorsement. Uh, I think if it were to go to any of those forums now, including this for endorsement, we'd be saying, so what? So what does this mean? And I think that's the next stage that the Integrated Care Partnership is going to have to work on together with uh, uh, local sort of systems uh, to do that. So that's uh, all I've got uh, this morning, Alan. Thanks. That's, that's a great um, summary. And thanks for all the work um, from yourself, but the people that you mentioned who've been involved in, 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 in this work. We're asked to uh, note and comment on the strategy and consider any implementation issues. So have I got any questions to Rupert or points immediately would like to be made? Um, I'll start with Phil and then um, Dr. Alcindy. Um, yeah, I and mean, we had a discussion last time, didn't we, about, the, like you said, Rupert, the kind of ridiculous timescales and, and the sense of how difficult um, it was to meaningfully engage again with people who live in Doncaster, which is what we were asked to do. Um, but I do think, I do think there are some positives that, that have come out of the, of the work. Um, so I think it's really positive that um, from an integrated care perspective, children and young people getting a good start in life is prioritised mm. because mm. a lot of the time children and young people getting a good start in life doesn't really come across as a core issue in, in kind of joint work with the NHS so it's really good that we can point to that being mm. something that South Yorkshire will be doing and something we've got to give prominence to in Doncaster and I also think it's good that there's a, there's a more than a nod, and there's some connection, maybe some other colleagues in the room, to, a, to economic regeneration and skill development mm -hmm. being absolutely key to people's health and well-being so we don't adopt a kind of a narrow disease focus. And again, that helps us, it helps our health partners think about how we need to apply some of our focus and our resources. So I think, I think there's some good stuff there to, for us to, to hang on to that, that can help us develop things in Doncaster. Thank you. I agree. With, I agree with that. And one of the comments I was going to make is that um, Rupert asked the question: How we around implementation? How we make sure that this South Yorkshire integrated care par 
partnership strategy links with the work that we've committed to here in here here in Doncaster. And what I would say is that actually you can see that read across, can't you, from here to the to the priorities that we've had in Doncaster for for for, for quite some time. Link, living healthier and longer lives and improved well-being is something right at the forefront of um, of this health and well-being board. Equally, the best start in life for our children and young people. So it's about, to me, a, bit, a little bit about the implementation. Um, Dr. Elsindy. Um Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Rupert. So um, that's the bit I wanted to pick up on was the, the three aims on page 15. So just firstly, just probably from an ignorance point of view, is there a reason it's 28 slash 30 rather than... 28, 29, or 29 slash 30? Are these things looked at over a couple of years? Yeah, so often, um, certainly if you look at uh, healthy life expectancy, the data is done on a three year, year cycle. average, okay. so it relates to the data. I'm sure for each of those headline mm -hmm. measures, there'll be um, uh, other proxy measures yeah. um, that we can look on an annual basis because you don't want to wait to the end of the three years to know if you're making a difference but that's why um we've got those uh, 28 30. yeah okay so it would almost be we'd be looking back in 20 in 2030 so i, I think that that's important because i guess that's sort of seven years away rather than four or five years away and and making a three-year change um on those incredibly complex things in in a five-year period um i mean I, I really respect and you know want that ambition there but i think when we're talking about the where we're at at the moment, I think addressing the stall and going in the right direction is a is a you know is a lofty ambition. Whereas I don't know whether we're just setting ourselves up to um, to fail by having sort of almost too ambitious a, a target. And I think that makes the the so what really important. So I know from one of my um, GP colleagues who's taken some time to read the whole thing and 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 feedback on it to us. It's sort of like, you know, if you, if you search sort of for general practice or primary care, I think there's six or seven mentions in the whole strategy, most of which was just about the structural side of things. So I think when you've got a really big set of ambitions, that's so what is, is vital because it's really hard to um, marry the two together with, with how we're feeling day to day at the moment. Thank you. Um, Cynthia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I would say that it is extremely well written, well informed. Um, I found it particularly interesting. Uh, again, I found it extremely ambitious. Um, I would say that um, the the four key purposes. I would say how is it measurable? That would be the big thing. And then I think the big word that I would take out of most of it because I think it seems to be a word that we share a lot in Doncaster which I don't think does an awful lot of good for people is deprivation um, deprived and I think if we sort of um, help our people by bringing them forward it always seems to be a thing that oh we deprived in Doncaster I think we need to be moving up a bit really but thank you thank you Dave. Thank you. Um, I was really pleased to see that, and I'm, and I'm sure you all realise that there are 29 references in this document to housing. Um, so I'm sure you've read them all. Um, they're generally referenced in terms of the health impacts in relation to poor quality housing and the need for good quality housing. Um, but if I'm going to be critical, I think it's a bit bereft of ideas in terms of what we should be doing about that. And in terms of what it does say is talking about the collaboration that needs to take place to create good new quality housing. The reality of that is that if we projected forward 10, 15 years and thought about what's the impact of good new housing, actually you're probably talking about 1% or 2% of housing stock. The vast majority of housing stock we have now and have had for the last 50 to 100 years is what we'll have in the next 50 to 100 years. So, so there's an issue here for me about um, it's a bit bereft on ideas about the vast majority of people are going to be living in very old properties that actually maybe are quite what we'd want for them in the future. So, so that issue about uh, how we modernise the stock and and not to to get 
political on this, but the government have consulted extensively 18 months or so ago on a new decent homes programme for housing. You'll, 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 I'm sure, all be aware of the impact that the last decent homes programme had in terms of modernising the housing stock, making sure everybody has central heating, and something like 98% of people in Doncaster have central heating, uh, uh, making sure people have decent bathrooms, kitchens, windows, etc., all that sort of stuff. The government have consulted, as I say, 18 months ago on a new programme, part of which is a real focus on thermal efficiency. Uh, and I have to say that in the last 18 months, the silence from DLUC has been deafening, that actually, whilst they've consulted, what are they then going to do about it? I do think that there's some issues about the, the changes in housing ministers that we've had. We, 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 we're quite sort of preeminent on housing ministers. We've had something like 15 in the last 12 years, you know, so we've really gone for that. Um, with Michael Gove back, I do think he has a focus on uh, the existing stock and what we can do about that. But we need some plans to come forward to make sure that not, not just in the social housing sector, but particularly in the private rented sector, housing conditions are really addressed. And I think there is something in here. And then the other, th that, that needs to be in here. And then the other thing that um, is sort of playing heavily on my mind at the moment is this whole issue that's come to the fore in the last two months about damp mould and condensation and the links between uh, damp and mouldy and uh, high moisture content in properties and health. And um, really the, the, one of the things that's bothering me about that is that the dialogue on that and the way it's been driven uh, is being highly critical of some landlords, quite rightly in some cases, to be fair, uh, but actually the link between damp mould condensation deprivation, as, as Cynthia is saying, and fuel poverty is really getting ignored. And what we're experiencing is this massive link between people feeling that they just cannot put the heating on and as a result living in really cold properties that as, an, as a result often they're, then they're now well insulated but as a result the moisture content within properties is not dissipated, is not extinguished from the house and, and we are uh, I was talking to Ruth about it before and I've talked to Rupert about it we are receiving letters from GPs telling us that the damp mould and condensation is causing health problems for their patients but without that full understanding of actually this isn't about you know, these properties need their pointing doing or the roof rebuilding or whatever it's often about the ways in which people are living in the properties and the problems that that is causing you know not, 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 not for any fault of their own but because of poverty uh, so, so that issue about poverty, uh, fuel poverty, and health and housing, I think, could perhaps. I mean, I know it's it's come to the fore probably since this has been drafted, but but I think it, I think it's a bit of an omission. So good to see the acknowledgement, but a little bit short on what we're going to do about it. So, so uh, you, you, I think I think that's a, some fair comment and feedback then, um, Rupert. So, if there's no more questions on that we note the report as a health and well-being board we have had some com comments on that and um just, just remind me is it are the time frames closed for any more comment on on, on this rupert or so i i will feed those comments yep, uh, back in because it's still um not been uh, been finalized F thanks I think, you yeah. know it sounds so from some of the conversation a bit like the conversation you had with the public questions you know the the question is, do we really understand the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, but I also think we ought to be prepared in the same way that Phil mentioned about co-production is when, um, you know, are we clear that what we are doing in these spaces are actually affecting and having any impact? Otherwise, we'll end up with a similar conversation where we say, you know, children getting the best start in life is great. And we'll say, well, we've got all these services um, and we won't make progress. So I think I'll feed these back. Thank you. I expect there'll be more work <coughs> doing, done through the Integrated Care Partnership around developing some of the ideas and let's leave those some of the times a bit um, light on detail. Um, and I'm sure some of that is um, because people don't want, at a South Yorkshire level, don't want to step on our toes, but equally we need to be prepared to say what is we're, all, we're already doing and be honest and courageous about where we've got gaps and we might need help from a, a different approach. 
Thank you. And to Councillor Ranson's point around uh, measurability of this and um, demonstrating the impact as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, item 8 is um, South Yorkshire Child Deaf Overview Panel Annual Report. Um, Dr Suckling will introduce this item, pages 79 to 112, which presents the South Yorkshire Child Deaf Overview Panel Annual Report for 21-22. Yeah, thanks, thanks Anthony. So uh, people will uh, remember last year we saw the first um, South Yorkshire Child Deaf Overview Panel Report at the Health and Wellbeing Board since the responsibilities moved from safeguarding boards and essentially Department of Education to Health and Wellbeing Boards and the Department of uh, Health. So this is based on data up to March uh, 22 and it's based on when the national data actually becomes available and uh, we are looking at as a South Yorkshire partnership to uh, maybe change the parameters of the date so it's more timely when it comes uh, forward to these uh, boards. So we have a, 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 a South Yorkshire group but we still have a, in, uh, each area still has a panel and uh, I chair the Doncaster panel uh, with lots of support from people in Richard's organisation, from uh, children's social care, from the public health team and from the police as well where we have a task to review uh, all deaths and to um, make sure that we ascertain what the cause of death is and any modifiable uh, factors. Uh, the, um, fortunately, you know, child deaths are relatively rare. So one of the reasons for doing this as a South Yorkshire level is we get to pool the data and we get to identify some of the key themes and we can do some of that work at a South Yorkshire uh, level. And uh, we've done work at a South Yorkshire level, particularly looking at the impact of maternal obesity uh, in uh, uh, child deaths. Locally, it's probably worth saying that two areas we have focused on in the last year is uh, suicide in young people. And unfortunately, we have had to use the what we call the suicide contagion protocol. So this is a, an approach where there is a suicide in a young person. We make sure that we provide immediate support and support to the family, but also to close friends and family as well. And thanks to Rihanna and her teams for all the support that they give uh, us in that. The other thing that we have seen is still we see um, uh, deaths in children related to unsafe uh, sleeping and in particular um, we've seen uh, deaths in um, what we would call experienced parents. So these would be parents who may have had you know, one or two other children uh, and what often is the case is that uh, uh, people know what they should do the health visitors or social workers remind them about what they should do but there are instances where situations change in the family very quickly uh, a childcare arrangement breaks down that uh, you're expecting and uh, people make uh, what turns out to be a bad decision uh, in, in the heat of the moment so there's quite a lot of uh, work nationally to look at this because this is a national uh, issue the final thing to do is just to, um, at the end of the report, there's a couple of things about what the sort of causes of uh, death are in uh, young people. And it's interest interesting that we've seen quite a few uh, deaths from sort of chromosomal or genetic um, anomalies, which are, you know, obviously uh, very distressing for uh, parents and, uh, and staff, actually, who are involved in those. That seems to be unusual. We don't know why that's happening in Doncaster, but we'll keep a, uh, an eye on that. And then the final thing to say is that we, as we've discussed in terms of the uh, impact of the pandemic, Doncaster's got the longest, um, we take the longest to review our cases at the um, CDOT panel compared to other places in South Yorkshire. There are a number of reasons for that. So some cases that are, um, under a police investigation or a coroner's uh, court take a long time, um, but probably the biggest reason is my availability. So particularly through um, COVID, I wasn't able to chair the board. So I'm actually looking um, with Rachel to, to see how we might increase our capacity to make sure that we do these as quickly as uh, possible. Um, I know there was a comment last year in the report that 
there wasn't quite so much in the locality section for Doncaster as in previous years, but hopefully you can see that we've uh, rectified that, but happy to take any uh, comments on that. Thanks. Okay, thanks Rupert, thanks for the report, which is um, very comprehensive and um, reflects the amount of work um, going on, but also the work that's still to be done. Is there any um, questions? Yes, Glynis. <clears throat> My colleague, who's actually uh, had to leave, um, wanted me to ask a, a couple of questions. So on the data for South Yorkshire, in comparison to Barnsley, our figures appear to be quite a lot higher. And, you know, I, I, I would have thought Barnsley was kind of comparable to us and whether there was any particular reason for those differences in figures. Um, and the other question was around the age group, um, which seems to be significantly higher in not 28 days and is rising and whether there was you know any particular reasons around that yeah thanks uh, just in terms of the numbers i mean doncaster is you know much bigger than barnsley actually so the the way we would usually compare it is compare barnsley with rotherham and then doncaster a bit higher uh, and, and then Sheffield. Uh, we, we're not significantly concerned about the numbers that have come through because this is um, this reports on when we've um, reviewed the deaths, not the deaths themselves. And actually, there's been um, some improvements in infant mortality rates in Doncaster. So that's um, uh, good. Just in terms of the 0 to 28 days, um, there was a change in the regulations. I think it was a couple of years ago in terms of the age that we should um, that the prematurity of babies that we should include in our CDOC reviews and obviously as um, maternal care gets better and neonatal care gets better there are more babies that are born that are on the I suppose cusp, you know cusp of uh, life that actually are, you know people are being supported and so I think we will see more babies in that sort of first 28 days of life uh, related to prematurity that are coming through. I think that's the reason. Thank you. Um, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rupert, for the report. <clears throat> These are obviously done with the purpose of learning, which I think is really um, the important part of them. And in that context, um, I've shared um, this document with the LMNS, the Local Midwifery Neonatal Services, which I happen to be um, the current chair in our um, SRO for, because I think the issues in here, we need to be um, really clear that we're joining up with the work of the LMNS in terms of improvement. And I think one of the things that we do need to be cited of is the information we report in things like um, 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 BMI, uh, is really important because in essence what the BMI drives in maternity services is it drives a higher acuity in terms of the needs of the mums at birth and in the perinatal, antenatal and postnatal periods and that's driving an increased demand for midwifery staff so we use a tool um, across the country really called Birth Rate Plus and what we're seeing in Birth Rate Plus is the, the number of ladies who deliver who are moving into the much higher acuity end of maternity care is significantly increasing. And certainly over the last five years, um, the number of um, ladies who've moved towards acuity levels four and five is significant to the point where um, our resources in terms of the number of midwives we need to provide maternity care is increased by about 10% because the more um, comorbidities and other factors you have at birth, the more input you need from qualified midwifery staff. And so from a practical point of view, whilst this is important in terms of its primary aim, which is to improve um, the outcomes, um, dealing with some of the issues in here are really important uh, from the resource point of view, because for the next few years, we don't have a um, significant low number of midwives in training to bridge the gap. Therefore, what we need to do is do two things, which is improve the general health of the population, 
which will reduce the demand for additional staff, whether it be midwifery and in other brackets. So I think the two elements are really important to lose track of. The reason we do these is learning and what we need to learn from them is across the board. And actually we all know that the value of reducing the BMI and obesity in all areas of healthcare is vital. And that does tie into some of the charts about where we sit on the national scales of deprivation because South Yorkshire and all of the areas of South Yorkshire are towards the wrong end of those tables and the wrong end of those tables drive considerable amount of additional funding in terms of what we need to provide the levels of service we want to provide thank you any more questions or comments ah oh. hi Rihanna Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much, Rupert, for the report, um, which is really comprehensive and very helpful, uh, in particular for us locally. So just to offer from our side in terms of um, <coughs> the wider children's services, uh, I think we need to strengthen now the relationship with, between CDOP um, and ourselves and playing more an active role. So whatever we can do to help with the review of the terms of reference or the panel itself, or in, indeed improving the process in timescales more than happy to engage. Phil. Just a couple of quick things. Um, um, probably be good to see an equalities lens applied to child deaths. I mean, it's maybe you might say small numbers, relatively small numbers each year, each one a complete tragedy, but hard to analyze only. But we've got a longitudinal perspective in Doncaster, and we've also got the South Yorkshire perspective so linked, I guess linked to Rich's point, I guess, about pro we might presume a correlation with deprivation, but we might also presume other correlations. It'd be interesting to get under that or just interesting necessary. And then the other thing is um, within the Sheffield section, there's a bit about the voice of children, young people and families. So it's not very well filled in, but it's there. So I'm just wondering, I'm guessing we will also want to be cited and, and clear that we've appropriately involved children, young people and families in the work? Yeah, so just uh, on that, I mean, the, the, I mean, the child death panels were set up to almost sort of review the, the death. So we've got very close relationship with the starting well groups that work on this sort of operationally that include not just our services, but also um, local people um, you know, lay members, but I will take that back in terms of the voice of the child. I'll also take back the equality issue because there were there have been a number of developments of the national database that we record things on, and that was a gap for quite a few years. So I'll take both of those back. Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much. So, Rupert, we um, we note the annual report. Thanks, thanks for bringing that here. Um, but also there's a few areas of learning that you're going to take away as a result of the comments. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so item nine is, is breastfeeding, a public health um, priority. Um, Laura, there you are, Laura. <laughs> and, and so you're going to take us um, through a presentation. Um, we've got half an hour for, the, for, 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 for this section, but usually we give around sort of 15 minutes and then opportunity for questions and comments and the report. And there's a series of recommendations that you bring into the board as well. Thank you, everybody. So as a reminder, my name's Laura Quinn. I'm a public health improvement coordinator within the Children, Young People and Families team. I want to talk to you today about breastfeeding and why it's a public health priority. And I'm also going to touch on its impact on climate change, the cost of living crisis and food insecurity. Okay. So in summary, we know that um, breastfeeding, there's a wealth of evidence to confirm that it promotes health, it prevents disease, and it helps to contribute Contri sorry, contribute to reducing health inequalities. But breastfeeding as a positive contributor to climate change and food insecurity is much less publicised. We need to continue to promote the positive effects of breastfeeding, which extend wider than just health. To do this, we need to create an environment where those who choose to breastfeed have the support in place to do this for as long as they wish. And this involves Doncaster businesses and venues signing up to the We Support Our Mums breastfeeding welcome scheme, 
and Doncaster Council as an, as an organisation having a breastfeeding policy in place for our own staff. So if I can just share a quote with you. So this quote is from James Grant, who was the former director of UNICEF. It's the power of breast milk. It states, breastfeeding is a natural safety net against the worst effects of poverty. It's almost as if breastfeeding takes the infant out of poverty for those first few months in order to give the child a fairer start in life and compensate for the injustice of the world in which it was born. So if I can just remind you please of a few of the benefits for baby, for those babies that are breastfed. So breastfeeding has long-term benefits for baby, lasting right into adulthood. Any amount of breast milk has a positive effect and the longer the mum can breastfeed, the longer the protection lasts and the greater the benefits. So for the baby, babies who are breastfed have a, a reduced risk of some of the following. So infections resulting with fewer visit, visits to hospital as a result, diarrhea and vomiting, as Rupert touched on before, SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, childhood leukemia, obesity, and cardiovascular disease in adulthood. And formula milk doesn't provide any of these health benefits to a baby. And again, there's also plenty of benefits for mum. So mums who choose to breastfeed have a reduced risk of some of the following. So breast cancer, ovarian cancer, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, obesity, developing type 2 diabetes. It can help protect against postnatal depression. And breastfeeding mums tend to burn off an additional 500 calories a day. So some mums find who are breastfed find it easier to get back um, to their pre-pregnancy weight. Obviously that's dependent on other factors, but it can help with weight loss. And breastfeeding also helps um, everything to go back to where it was before. So there's loads and loads of benefits for mum as well. But despite all these health benefits that we really do try and promote, this is the breastfeeding data that we have for Doncaster. So we collect two sets of data. One is called First Feed. So that's the data that midwives collect in hospital. And last year, from all the Doncaster women giving birth, we had 57.5% of women who chose to give their first feed as breast milk. At the six to eight week data collection, this is what our health visitors get, that figure had already dropped to an average 35%. So you can see in a relatively short space of time, we do lose a lot of our breastfeeding mums. And this data is pretty static. It doesn't particularly change that much. So I started thinking about a slightly different approach. So the health benefits of breastfeeding work for some people but not quite for everybody. And a couple of years ago, I attended a, um, a BFI UNICEF conference where one of the speakers talk, spoke about the links between breastfeeding, climate change and the environment. And myself and some of my colleagues, infant feeding leads in Yorkshire and Humber, decided to get together to see what we could do to kind of promote this because we know younger people and the next generations of parents are much more engaged with what they can do to kind of protect the environment and climate change. And so trying to promote those links might be another kind of hook in. So what do we know about breastfeeding and its link to climate change? So since the 1980s, there's been an 83% increase in climate related disasters, such as floods, droughts, storms, which in increase food insecurity. In 2016, over 530 million children lived in countries affected by extreme weather events and other climate-related emergencies, such as epidemics and crop failure. Due to climate change, heat waves, as we experienced last year in our own country, are increasingly common, and we've observed this locally and globally. We know that infants have a higher risk of dehydration due to their size, and that hospital admissions increase significantly for infants during heat waves. Recent changing weather conditions have led to poorer harvests, and higher production costs which families are feeling the burden of. Higher food and energy prices will be especially harmful to low income and vulnerable families. So by supporting and increasing breastfeeding rates, we will see both long-term benefits for health and climate change and an immediate impact for reducing outgoing costs for families and protecting short-term health. 
So I've, I've pinched this up slide from a, a colleague in Harrogate, but it's just quite visual and shows you all the different impacts that climate change can have on our health sector. So there's lots of different kind of considerations to think of, breastfeeding just being one of those. And if I can just share a few facts with you about the climate cost of formula milk. So the global infant formula milk market is estimated at 2.7 billion tonnes pounds, so that should say in 2017. Each kilogram <coughs> of milk formula generates four kilograms of greenhouse gas around the world during production. And the majority of infant formula companies <coughs> are based in the EU. So we are one of the largest exporters, exporting nearly 600,000 tonnes across the world, which is hundreds of thousands of transport miles. And again, a little bit about the carbon footprint of artificial formula. So for the UK alone, carbon emission savings gained by supporting mothers to breastfeed would equate to taking between 50,000 and 77,000 cars off the road each year. Powdered infant formula can only be safely made with water that has been heated to at least 70 degrees, giving an energy use equivalent to charging 200 million smartphones each year. Breastfeeding for just six months saves an estimated 95 to 153 kilograms of CO2 equivalent to per baby compared with formula feeding. And the production of unnecessary infant and toddler formulas exacerbates this environmental damage and should be a matter of increasing global concern. So what is essential? So support is essential. And again, I've pinched this from colleagues in Barnsley who have been working on, on breastfeeding and climate change with me. And if you can look at these two different cycles, so we've got the cycle of breast milk, which predominantly involves a support network. And so for breastfeeding to be successful, we need parents to be supportive. We need grandparents on board. We need the wider community. As you can see from the formula milk cycle, there's a lot more involved in, in terms of that transportation. I'll come back to this because um, we have produced a short animation which I'd like to share with you at the end of my presentation. So a little bit about what we've been doing in Doncaster. So hopefully you may have seen um, our scheme in any venues that you may visit. So we have a scheme called We Support Our Mums, which is our breastfeeding welcome scheme for Doncaster. We've currently got 122 local businesses signed up, but with how many businesses and places we've got in Doncaster, that's not that many. So I would most definitely like your support in helping us to recruit more businesses. We need mums to know that they're welcome to breastfeed in any public place in Doncaster, as supported by the Equality Act 2010. So it's not particularly optional, but it's about mums feeling comfortable and supported to do so. Trying to promote breastfeeding is quite difficult, but we have um, paid for a small advert on the Doncaster Mumbler site, if anybody's familiar with that. We've chosen Doncaster Mumbler because it has a huge footfall and a lot of Doncaster parents do use that site. So we do try and promote breastfeeding on there and that links back to our health visiting um, page. We've paid for quite a few blogs. We've got live adverts, um, we've got newsletters, etc. And again, We've got a lot of different breastfeeding related resources to try and show parents what support is out there because the question we quite often get is, we didn't get that support, I struggled to breastfeed and I didn't know where to kind of turn. So again, for anybody working in the hospital, you may see we've got these pull up banners and um, they've been designed just to give some just quick information about what we have got available. And again, our colleagues working in family hubs have all been trained. They can also give breastfeeding support and when you have your appointment there, you'll get a little card which will introduce your family hub worker to let the parent know that there's this support there as well. So, Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind, could you um, play that little animation and then I'll go back to what my asks are, please.
you. <clears throat> so just to say that animation has been funded by South Yorkshire and Bassett Law ICB and we have permission for that animation to be used by colleagues across the country. Um, so going back to my ask, please. Oh, sorry. Do I need to change this? Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. So I'd like to ask the board to continue to support breastfeeding as a public health priority, but to consider those wider benefits that reach further than just health. I'd like support in encouraging venues to sign up to the We Support Our Mums scheme. Any business is, is able to join, including GP practices, dental practices, pharmacies, schools, anywhere that a mum may need to go. And I'd like to ask specifically to Doncaster Council, as a large employer, I'd like to see that we have a breastfeeding policy in place to demonstrate to our employees returning to work that we support them. Um, thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Okay. Um, thanks, Laura. That was really good. Really informative. I like the video. Um, there's some great information in there. So I'm going to open it up to questions first of all, and then we'll come back to the recommendations. So, Councillor Ranson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Laura, thank you very much for a, a, an excellent presentation. Um, I must admit, I hadn't thought about the impact on the environment. Uh, and considering I have a rural climate change group, it's something that I should definitely be bringing up. So uh, I do sort of thank you for that. The other thing I was going to say was regarding your video, do you play it in GP surgeries? Do you um, play it in the French Gate Centre? So we've only just got the video oh, right. and I'm just in the process of putting some infant feeding pages together for the Doncaster Council website. So it will go on there, but anybody is able to use the video. It's been sent out to infant feeding colleagues in R- and DBHT who have also got infant feeding pages. So any place where it will sit, it can go. Anybody's able to utilize it. So if anybody would like to use it, then please do get in, in contact because we, we can share it far and wide and that's the aim it's a it's a public facing animation and it's just to get people thinking it's not aimed to kind of what we don't want to do is make parents feel guilty about their choices and we definitely don't want want mums to feel to feel guilty if they, if they are formula feeding that they've also got kind of environmental you know they're responsible for that as well but it's just to make people think like you say a lot of people don't always make that connection no excellent thank you uh, Richard. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I also didn't know really about the impacts on um, on the environment, so it's really helpful. One of the issues I think that you have with the breastfeeding is, is that some of the videos make it sound really easy. And I know from my wife's experience that it isn't, and that there's a lot of uh, things that can go uh, wrong and be quite difficult, including that balance between returning to some normality of a normal life with a baby, particularly a young baby, and things like going back to work early because obviously going back to work early by itself on breastfeeding facilities is helpful but you do need potentially to express milk freeze milk pack yeah. milk instruct you know you, 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 your child care or your parents your grandparents and so one of the things is the audience I think is a wider audience than just necessarily mums it's, a, it's an audience that includes that wider extended family as well as employers and it is about understanding what the balance is because actually if you don't have much disposable income or otherwise it can sometimes be quite a lot easier to stop breastfeeding and go to breast milk because you've got a bottle and you can leave baby with a mom or nano and I think one of the things we've got to do is, is understand the rounded package mm -hmm. because actually yeah. the feedback you get from mums is certainly establishing breastfeeding and certainly carrying on breastfeeding and I absolutely accept that even a very short period of breastfeeding is really good and in the baby <clears throat> mum's best interest but you ideally want that to be quite a long period don't you to get the maximum benefit and I think we've got to think more widely about how do you get to the point where actually the initial rate initial initial rates of 55 percent are high but then they're sustained at six and eight weeks because that drop off is is one of the things that I think is a factor of the points that I'm sort of touching on yeah I think that's a really fair point and I think for anybody who has breastfed themselves or has experienced it's not easy and um, it can be quite a challenging time and I think that's why that picture with the mum on the settee with the people around is so important because that's what you need for breastfeeding to be successful you need a support network and you might need some help but I think in Doncaster we've never been in such a good place with the infant feeding support that we've got 
Um, we've got a good, really good infant feeding team now at DBHT. We've got an infant feeding team within health visitors. We've got a lot of infant feeding support and within the family hubs. And I don't think we do a good enough job of promoting what help we've got. So I think we've got parents out there potentially struggling and not realising what they can access. We've got breast pump scheme. Um, we, you know, we have we have got a lot, but it's about kind of promoting it and making sure people know. But I think having a, having a newborn baby is not easy, whether you decide to breastfeed or formula feed. It's um, it's a yeah, challenge. Yeah, I think I think it is. I think, but I also think there's that bit about making sure whilst you don't overplay that it's not easy and you're not and you, you know and others have had all these problems, you know, because that's about realism and moving forward. And the hook is, in terms of why you do it, is all of the things on your slide. But if we sort of only portray sort of beaming mum with loads of support around her and it all looks like it's going to be you know absolutely no problem we're not necessarily preparing people you will have your good days you will have your bad days and you know you're not on your own and it's not just you it's your family yeah. and all that sort of stuff okay. probably is one of the things we do need to drive on okay I thought hopefully that's helpful with the um, communication message Dr Alcindy oh sorry Rupert first uh, thanks Anthony so I think that was really helpful to sort of Re reframe the approach. I think you know it does relate to some of the conversations we've had today about you know understanding what the barriers uh, are. Also, uh, I know Laura, you know some some of the support you know it's peer led, so it's not a medical mm. approach. And I suppose one of the things um, that you know in terms of the benefits is particularly around sort of child attachment. And uh, we have seen you know through the, the pandemic, you know, real impacts on children's early development. And I'm sure this would be a help uh, to it. I, I think, as Richard said, you know, it, it's sort of making sure that the offer is there, but without sort of ramming it down people's uh, throats. Um, and I think there is, you know, that's a really interesting um, idea of a lens of looking at it from an environment uh, perspective. I think you should do that. And certainly from a council perspective, I'll take that away with Jill Parker. Yeah. In terms of where we are with our breastfeeding there's, policy. There's avenues to do that, isn't there? Good, great. Thank you. Um, Nabil. Um, thanks, Laura. Just to echo everyone else's um, comments, really. I'd be interested to look at that. I guess it's about 20%, isn't it? You know, 50 odd to, to 30 odd at six to eight weeks. If we've sort of gone in and to really understand, I guess, the, the demographics and the situations around that, because then we could sort of identify people who, who are leaving the hospital breastfeeding who may be worth actually doing them a proactive call. In those, cause it might be difficult to call everyone, but actually, if we knew that sort of it was on average the person in this age range who are you know it's a first child and um, la you know doesn't have that family support around them, they're the ones who might benefit from from reaching out actively rather than relying on them to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay then, um, health mm. conversation. This so, um, Laura, recommendations for the board. We've considered and noted the information presented. Thank you very much. That was that was excellent. I'm hearing continued to support um, breastfeeding as a public health priority, acknowledging um, the benefits um, that, that, that you've described. The two other ones, encourage venues to sign up to We Support Our Mums, and any business open to the members of the public is able to join the scheme for three. I think I heard you said 122. Um, I think I can see, see, see some support for that. I think there's something about the avenues we, we, we do that. You know, for example, the Chamber, um, you may have already done that already. But certainly f through some of our health and care organisations, GP practices, etc., we can do that. There might be just something in the mechanisms um, for, for that, Lucy, that, that we can perhaps communicate that as a result of this. Um, so thank you. And then... <clears throat> There's a, res there's a specific request to the council, but I was going to ask other organisations in the room as well. Um, request that Doncaster Council as an employee uh, implements breastfeeding policy, demonstrating to employees returning to work that we support them. Let's start with council colleagues then. So, Phil? Yeah, I think Rupert said we'll, we'll yeah. take it on. Yeah. It'd be interesting to have a discussion outside the meeting about yeah. if that's been difficult in the council, why that might have been. Yeah. But from I think from the perspective of directors in the room, we'd be very happy to sponsor that. I mean, it's not for a man to dictate what a woman does with her body. <laughs> but, but, the, but, the, but the issue is more about providing opportunities yeah. for people to take positive choices without feeling like it's difficult. Yeah. And I, I, had a, I had a quick look at council guidance on it. It seems fairly slight, right. so uh, 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 you're right to identify the gap. Yes, um, and yeah. I think that we've only got a couple of sentences at present about breastfeeding. Right, okay. Um, Rihanna, help fill out with that one. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah those... really interesting as well, though, within the family hubs, we are going for full accreditation for BFI um, accreditation. So it's kind of conflicting policies, isn't it? Is we're promoting it for our um, communities, but we don't kind of walk the walk and talk the talk in the council. So fully supported, then we'll do whatever to take it, get it over the line. Thank you. And for some of the other organisations in the room, then I, I don't know if frankly if I'm honest Laura on where we stand as an as an ICB um so so that's something for me to t to take back Richard do you, do you have a policy within the um within the acute trust sorry yeah we have a policy in respect of the health and well-being offer and obviously that was combined with you know other aspects of trying to make it easy for you know mums and families with babies in terms of changing facilities and others um, although it is an old building and it's difficult but yeah as far as I'm aware we've got a, a breastfeeding policy as part of that health and wellbeing suite. I just wondered if there was an opportunity here to have a look at the you know obviously there's there's the ambition of the council here but look as place partners um, really on, 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 on what we can do around that so there's perhaps a bigger potential for that Laura if we can get this right. Okay thank you very much. We're on to our last agenda item, which is Doncaster Economic Strategy 2030. Seems a long way away that, Mitch, but <laughs> there we go. So um, do you want to introduce yourself again? And I think it's Emily, isn't it? And um, again, there's a presentation as such and uh, some recommendations for it. Yes, thanks, Jay. You say it's a long way away, but I can't believe we're already in the middle of January 2023. Um, so um, for those of you um, who don't know, me, just remind you, my name is Mitch Salt. I'm a Senior Policy and Insight Manager at the City of Doncaster Council. It's going to take a little time to get used to saying that. I'll just pass on to my colleague to um, introduce herself as well. Hi, Emily Adams, uh, Policy Manager in the same team as Mitch. And uh, what we wanted to do today was to um, kind of present the now approved Doncaster Economic Strategy 2030. Uh, we did come to the Health and Wellbeing Board on the 1st of September, I want to say last year. Um, would you believe it was a, one monarch and two prime ministers ago? Um, obviously since then, at the time when we came in September, it was a, an emerging strategy uh, with an emerging framework. Uh, and we came to the Health and Wellbeing Board to kind of discuss some of the things we've been learning through our engagement. Obviously since then, we've um, we have worked on the strategy, obviously developed up that framework, gone out with further consultation on it. And, and I know some colleagues from the, from the health and care sector will be able to um, come to some events we did. I know you did yourself, um, Chair. And then that went through the formal approvals process with Cabinet giving it the green light on the 14th of December, 2022. Uh, so what we wanted to do today, uh, just a couple of things really, um, obviously present the strategy, um, just remind people about the backgrounds as where it's come from, uh, what the actual strategy framework looks like itself, um, you have all got the strategy um, in your notes. Um, then we really wanted to talk about the, the main crux of this is because is, we want a different approach to the economy. What does that then relationship look like with health and well-being? Um, and then identify some of the areas we've um, identified in the strategy as kind of key connection points with health and well-being and vice versa. And then just a couple of asks of um, the board. In particular, what I'm quite keen to, um, for colleagues to think about as we go along is what are those collaboration points? Especially as the health and wellbeing board starts to think about its priorities for you know this year for 23, 24, linking in actually with the ICB uh, strategy. What are some of the things that kind of the Team Doncaster Economic Board and the delivery group will have for the strategy can do alongside kind of the health and wellbeing board and any other associated groups, partnership networks uh, to really drive that symmetry uh, of health and wellbeing alongside the economy. So I'm going to first pass over to Emily, who's going to go and run through the first couple of slides, um, and then you'll get a little bit more of me. Yeah, so um, just to start with a bit of background to kind of set the scene of the strategy, uh, I'm sure you'll all be aware in uh, 2021, Team Doncaster launched a 2030 Boris strategy, which was Doncaster delivering together. Um, that Boris strategy has an emphasis on well-being as demonstrated in the well-being wheel that you can see on the screen, um, which sets out Doncaster's goal for thriving people, places and planets. Um, this economic strategy has been developed to outline the economy's role in delivering these well-being goals, including Team Doncaster's intention to transition towards a well-being economy. Um, 
And just to note that the launch of this strategy obviously comes at a time of economic uncertainty and a cost of living crisis that's having an impact on our residents and businesses. Um, so that's why this strategy looks to address both the current crisis and limit the harm to well-being of our residents, as well as actions that will help tackle socioeconomic challenges and inequalities in the long term. Um, and one of these key areas has been around health. Um, and because we want an economy that centres well-being, we took a new approach to strategy development to ensure that well-being of all residents, businesses and the planet was embedded throughout the strategy. Um, and this took the form of a develop, development through engagement approach, uh, which meant working with different stakeholders from across Doncaster, including residents, members, businesses, public sector and third sector, to co-produce this strategy to make sure that it's inclusive, regenerative and centres well-being. Um, and as you can see on this slide, the core aim of this economic strategy is to develop a regenerative and inclusive economy for thriving people, places and planet. Uh, this marks a step change for the borough in terms of how Doncaster views its local economy um, and it, as it outlines a transition towards a well-being economy. Um, and so to support this transition, a uh, mission-orientated policy approach was undertaken. Um, three missions have been developed that support the borough strategy's commitment to thriving people, places and planet. Um, the economic missions state that by 2030 we aspire to have an economy that improves the living standards for all and leaves no people behind, a more resilient productive economy across all places, a greener regenerative economy that restores and enhances our planet. And central to the delivery of these missions is an overall new approach to what a successful economy looks like uh, through the lens of good growth, which is healthy and compassionate. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that the economy and health are not in competition with each other. They're mutually supporting. Um, it's demonstrated beyond doubt that health resilience at all levels is vital to the functioning of our economy and the economy is vital to health resilience. Access to high quality health care is essential for health and well-being of our residents, but it's not the lack of health care that leads people to become ill in the first place. It's the conditions in which people live and work. Um, so partners across Doncaster can and should be responsible actors in improving the conditions in which people live and work um, and can, as a result, be forces for good in creating greater health equity. Um, therefore, one of the key measures of the value of economic growth is the extent to which it improves the health and well-being of Doncaster's residents. Um, and the other side to this is the economic benefits of improving the health of our residents. Um, poor health is setting back the economy. So from July 2021 to June 2022, 34.7% of economic inactivity was due to long-term health problems. So in other words, we need to see health as a new wealth, and in doing so, we need to value both the health benefits of an inclusive and regenerative economy, but also the economic benefits of health. Thanks, um, and I suppose just um, that bit there kind of indicates what we mean by taking a, a more regenerative approach. It's really that whole systems thinking. So not just seeing uh, the success of an economy as endless growth of GVA and GDP and, and kind of everything will eventually trickle down to residents because I think we all kind of know despite what Liz Trust thought back in autumn it hasn't really worked for places it is about some of those other metrics it's about actually seeing uh, well-being in its broadest sense improve um, for, for people uh, places and also uh, the planet understanding that environment link uh, what I wanted to do over uh, this slide was talk about, well, okay, that's great, but what does what does the strategy then say on on you know some of the priorities, and what that might mean for health and well-being? And um, so, as you can see on the on the screen, this is uh, my terribly um, PowerPoint produced uh, priority wheel. There will be a design version, hopefully, coming in the next couple of months, which will do this a lot better than I will. Uh, but there's five priorities um, which kind of came out, say, from the consultation um, or the engagement activity we did, and, and therefore our responses. Um, they're on the screen. I'm going to go through each one of them and what they say in relationship to how they can help uh, work with health and well-being. I suppose what I also wanted, wanted to highlight is across the strategy, we really wanted to include fairness and inclusion as kind of a cross-cutting uh, principle. Um, and then alongside that, also the need to bring kind of industry and talent slash skills development together. 
Um, it was one of the things that um, through the engagement and also we've done some fantastic work in the education skills strategy, we've recognized as a borough, it's really important to get, to get right. But what we didn't want to do with the strategy was just to have a health priority on its own thinking, you know, uh, we can highlight help in that way. What we need to do is actually embed health across. So this is why I'm gonna explain the priorities and, and how it links to health and well-being. So the first priority um, industry platforms, I mean, this is just essentially about supporting uh, key sectors through kind of integrating uh, both industry in its widest sense, um, that skills development and, and research and innovation support um, across kind of key, um, key clusters in key sites across the borough. Now, you know, on a traditional sense, you might be thinking, well, what does industry and, and health and care have um, kind of in common? Well, actually, we undertook a piece of work to identify key sectors of opportunity, some of the key areas we want to focus in on. One of those is health and, and care. Um, so because we wanted to take a broader view to industry, it's not just about, again, those that might be heavily linked to Janet GVA or productivity. It is about some of those sectors are actually key to kind of from a foundational well-being point of view, health and care being one of them. So with education skills colleagues and linking into some of the work that's going on with the Center of Excellence work around education skills, we want to tap into um, really kind of bringing in some of the employment uh, and career progression types thing. And again, business innovation support to how we can create that thriving health and care sector and really bring kind of the, the business and the innovation stuff to the forefront. Uh, one thing we see in this is how you know progression in other industries can actually help progress health and care. So one of the sectors is around the creative and digital sector. Uh, so again, how can we kind of link the technologies coming out with some of those businesses working in the creative and digital sector, you know, virtual reality and kind of augmented reality, et cetera. And how can that help deliver health and care services, but also training simulations and things like that. Then moving on to uh, employment opportunities uh, for all, it, it is about providing kind of equitable access to employment through a compassionate approach to employment support, uh, encouraging organizations to have a positive social impact and supporting employees to provide inclusive employment opportunities. Now, we were really taken aback and we, we really liked as a, when we were developing this, the compassionate approach to weight. Um, a lot of things that came out of engagement was some of the stigma associated with people who want to access employment opportunities, employment services, maybe those who are maybe accessing benefits. Uh, there is a stigma associated sometimes when they access kind of DWP services, et cetera. We want to develop a compassionate approach to employment. So really learning from the principles of the compassionate approach to weight uh, and obesity model, and how can we implement that as a partnership into some of our employment services. So actually being more person-centered and there is some really good work we can build on, such as Work in Win, which is a, a regional program. But how can we embed that in some of our own internal council employment services, like the employment hubs and the advanced program, but also then influence work at DWP. Uh, and then that idea again of <clears throat> kind of socially conscious organizations. Uh, within that, there's a lot of work that's been done by Sir Michael Marmot uh, and the role of kind of institutions. So working with the private sector and through Business Doncaster to get them to see how actually um, taking kind of socially conscious principles and developing them up with businesses um, can really help benefit not only uh, businesses and kind of their outputs, but the health and well-being of staff. And I think the uh, breastfeeding example by law is actually a really good example of that. So a tangible thing for me coming out of this is how we link in that program with some of that, what a socially conscious organization looks like um, to really drive that forward within the private sector. Uh, the third priority uh, around the, the, the green economy. And um, so obviously since the last time we did an economic strategy, uh, the climate change crisis has really been at the forefront of local, regional and national policy. So I really wanting to obviously create that thriving green sector, uh, but also transition our industries and communities to be more kind of circular, low waste, low carbon, and kind of protecting and restoring biodiversity and natural capital. Uh, and there's already some things happening within this space, um, which kind of heavily links to health and well-being. So the Fix Our Food program that I know um, public health and colleagues within PICA have been working on. Um, the idea of circular communities, we really want to work and um, develop this program with kind of local residents through the localities model. But this for me, you know, a big as um, aspect of that would be about supporting access to local nutritious and affordable food and growing local food systems. Obviously, again, the decarbonization of industry heavily related to kind of promoting cleaner air and reducing air quality impacts on health. And again, linking in kind of businesses with retrofitting opportunities 
to see how can businesses really come to the forefront of helping accelerate kind of the improvement of homes, improving their warmth and reducing uh, kind of fuel poverty across the borough. Um, the vibrant places priority. So this is about redirecting wealth back into kind of our local economies, recognizing Doncaster as the, I believe we're still a metropolitan borough. I don't really know how it works now. We're a city council, but the largest anyway in the country, we have a diverse population. We have diverse communities. So really thinking about how we redirect wealth back into those uh, using initiatives such as community wealth building uh, and the fantastic work the Nessus team is doing already uh, and that program continuing thinking about healthy city center and town center regeneration. Um, so again, how when we do master planning, it has health and well-being and completely embedded into the planning system, into the design system, but also the implementation, including consultation with key stakeholders uh, and kind of promoting again, um, cultural sector, which we know has massive positive impacts on well-being and health and, and health and well-being itself. Uh, one, you know, one model and in, in the strategy we really want to develop to think about this way is how can we incorporate kind of the 20 minute neighborhood model into our master planning and kind of our shaping and place shaping of towns and, and the um, places around the borough. And how can we learn from the Shaping Stainforth program um, to kind of embed citizens within that kind of consultation process. And then finally, physical and digital connectivity, which kind of says what it does on the tin, to be honest, kind of supporting residents to access economic opportunity through accessible and affordable transport options, the rollout of broadband infrastructure, and kind of supporting that digital skills development. You know, again, a lot of work's already happened in this space, but the strategy talks about really prioritizing that active travel network improvements with kind of future funding and investment and working with the city region um, to kind of develop a really affordable bus network. We know it's a challenge at the minute and there is work going on at South Yorkshire Combined Authority uh, level, but us really as a local authority putting more pressure on that to make an affordable transport system that works for residents. Um, kind of undertaking work with health partners, the voluntary sector and relevant transport companies to maybe think how we can make public transport more accessible. So we really be interested about taking some of the learnings uh, and feeding them into kind of some of the decisions happening at a, a regional level. Promoting and supporting the work of Get Doncaster moving with businesses, which links into that idea of socially conscious business, but how can we get businesses um, to think more themselves about kind of, um, you know, um, cycle to work schemes, um, et cetera and also taking any learnings from the active travel social prescribing pilot and how that can influence further um, actions. And then uh, working with community groups and about how do we support digital infrastructure and accessibility, uh, especially on and how that might reduce social isolation of, of residents. Uh, the strategy itself, um, one thing we're really um, intrigued about, I'll say there's, there's 109 actions. So in the strategy itself, we'd love to see the, the more defined kind of the, the health and wellbeing action links. Obviously, with the Fairness and Inclusion Commission, uh, the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission, sorry, uh, coming online this year, I know um, income and employment, I believe, are two of the sessions uh, we've outlined in the strategy. We're really looking forward to seeing what the recommendations of that commission are and looking to embed those recommendations within our delivery and within our action plans. So what we really try to outline and say is, is an economy that works better for health and well-being and, and hopefully they're just an indication of, of how we really see kind of more of a health and all policies approach and, and, and transition towards an economy that thinks in that space it will be difficult obviously trying to get um our anchor organizations and our businesses to really see the value of um kind of health as the new wealth but i think we as colleagues across the room know the intrinsic value uh, and kind of that um diagram uh, just here about what really goes into your health. As you say, 50% there is stuff which the economy can influence, you know, health behaviors and healthcare only representing the other 50%. Um, so just finally, uh, so next steps, uh, we're looking to do a, a formal launch of the strategy. Um, hopefully it'll be on the Team Doncaster website next week. Uh, we'll be doing a soft launch at the Business Doncaster Showcase. If any colleagues are at the showcase on the 2nd of February, uh, please do say hello. Uh, we'll then be doing a more formal uh, launch in March. We're just starting to work out um, the development of detailed action plans across those priorities, really focusing on what we're going to be able to achieve over the next one to two years and the resources required to be able to do that. And then the beginning, the delivery of key actions. And this is where we'll be reaching out to health and wellbeing colleagues as kind of key delivery partners across some of those strands within the strategy. A lot of colleagues are already involved in the developments. So we're looking to feed that through into the delivery. Um, so then just uh, a couple of recommendations, Chair. Um, hopefully the board's kind of recognize and endorse the, the strategy itself. 
uh, recognize, endorse those opportunities kind of outlined in the um, strategy, the papers and the presentation. Um, but then probably not one for now, but maybe something for colleagues to, to get back to us on. But that really, what are the further opportunities for collaboration between the objectives of the strategy, but also health and wellbeing improvement, especially thinking about any recommended prioritization based on any upcoming work of the board. So if there's any key focuses partners are, are looking at um, over the next year, which really relates to the strategy, letting us know so we can, again, prioritize action and delivery across that so we're not missing an opportunity. And I'll be really intrigued um, as the um, integrated care board strategy action start to get developed, how we can link in with that um, board ambition around the economy, because um, those three big things, on four big things onto that fitting really well with what we want to try to achieve uh, locally. So again, that's another um, future opportunity. But thank you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Mitch, and thanks, Emily. I know there's a hell of a lot of work gone into got into that to get us to this place. So thanks for bringing it back to the uh, to the health and well-being board. I'm going to open it up to questions, and we'll come back to the recommendation. Hi, Richard. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. When I read the papers, um, I was struck by the importance of health to the economy, not in the sense of the health promotion aspects of it, or the health and equalities aspect, or keeping people in work but actually the contribution that health and social care makes to the economy in the sense of its income and also the contribution that our employees make as citizens of Doncaster and in terms of the council itself. And I was interested and struck by your points in terms of where you press in, if you like, on the value of health in terms of um, ensuring the workforce is fit and healthy and back for the employers or were you actually pointing to that one of the things that we do have to think about as Doncaster Place is how we make sure that the health economy grows is sustained it's got good premises and all the other sorts of things in the same sense and in the same way we would with any of the other major employers listed because on your charts health and social care is the largest employer within Doncaster and I'm never really sure if that's known and seen with the same sorts of importance of other employers because without health there is no economy both from the sense of its income or both from the sense of keeping people fit and at work so I was just checking really what you were saying in this document about health in that context it's, it's the balance of recognizing both those things and actually one not being more important than the other and that's the position we want to get to so the idea around health and care being one of those key sex opportunity is to raise it against that kind of uh, notion of it. it is a key industry if you're going to look at it from a crude sense like that so doing that work about promoting that um, health and care sector one to be able to improve efficiency because we know it has direct impact on kind of health outcomes and obviously the, the, the standard of health we can do but two because then it does raise kind of career aspirations which then has a knock-on impact on um, people's ability to be able to spend locally and also lift people out of poverty uh, but again, that has then more impacts on the health and well-being of residents want to go back into the economy. So it, it, it's, it's those two points to me aren't mutually exclusive things, the things you mentioned. It's now recognising actually they're part of the same thing and that's what we're trying to move towards. Um, and that's where you know, in the action stuff we're looking to work with, let's say yourselves, um, and obviously the, I know the work that's going on in the Centre of Excellence for, for Health and Care. And we're, we're about to start um, some, some work over the coming months where we're engaging with kind of DBTH, et cetera. So what would those actions look like? What do you need from um, kind of a more growing that sector? And then wherefore, what can we do to be able to help promote that and what actions are required to deliver that? Yeah, because I, I think that's the really important bit because as people know, we've been trying to secure funding for a new hospital. But the question comes is, if that isn't forthcoming soon, what do we do? Because the reality is, is if we don't have... Um, the health service all the issues that you've indicated about health inequalities and promotion others are challenging but fundamentally the document says that health and social care is the largest employer in Doncaster that's that's my interpretation of the information and you're nodding so you agree so I think that collectively we've got to work out and how we support health with its agendas with education training are we going to drive on uh, bringing you know, uh, health and social care education into and provided in Doncaster? Because a lot of that economic advantage is currently lost to Sheffield. You know, We train, as I've said here many times, a third of all of the health and social care students in South Yorkshire, but it, they're based in Sheffield. And actually, that's a huge opportunity for us if we join up some of that thinking, because 
it's a huge opportunity for some of the agendas, children's aspirations, etc. Opportunities for good jobs, but economic opportunities are huge. If you have students based and living in Sheffield, in they spend the money in Sheffield, they they develop the careers, recruitment's easier. If they live in Doncaster, you'll see the impact and effect of that on the other industries that are clearly part of the strategy. So I'd encourage some real thought on what is the Doncaster strategy for the development of health and social care over the next decade. Yeah, I, so would I. And I think it does play to your second two sort of recommendations or questions, Mitch, about how we, how we, what are the forums and the mechanisms for that for taking this work forward because it is absolutely crucial for, for for our workforce. So, I don't want to lose that point. Can we can we come back to that, please, at the end when we take those recommendations? I think it was Rihanna and then Steve. Thank you very much, Anthony. So, just in in answer to your question, Richard, we are actually considering a university city, and what that looks like, and having a different. Um, uh, educational pathways and actually creating that provision locally so would more than happy to engage you in that conversation when we are at the appropriate time to do so I mean I think it's fire to Rihanna because as I said the the actual catchment the the group that you're looking at is health and social care students but we've heard already a presentation on breastfeeding and its impact on uh, climate and global uh, climate issues well Three and a half thousand students driving backwards and forwards to Sheffield to Doncaster to get their training in are producing a lot of carbon, and 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 actually, however we look at it, it makes lots of sense. And so we've together got to work out how to facilitate that because there's an awful lot of jobs associated to the students that would come and live in Doncaster. Thank you, Steve. Um, you got me on one of my pet subjects here, so. Um, Anthony, stop me, because I, I could go on about this for absolutely yonks. Um, my career history included being on the Chamber of Commerce Board between 2002 and 2009. Uh, I don't seem very much different in this than, than was produced in 2002, save for the green element of it. I think this report, whilst there's plenty to commend within it, misses the point that Doncaster is in a competitive um, environment with its neighbours in and around uh, South Yorkshire and Yorkshire. Richard's point is exactly right. How do you make Doncaster a place where people want to bring their business, and want to live and want to bring up their families in, in, a, in a pleasant environment? Look at the successful places in Yorkshire where people have created successful um, city centre environments, Leeds, Sheffield to a lesser extent, people live in the centre of the city. Who'd, wh who, who would live in the centre of Doncaster? What are we doing about that? And where is that in your plan? So without that central city um, vibe, the cafe culture, for want of a better phrase, Doncaster is really going to struggle to bring in the sort of people that it needs. The thing that is never addressed, in my opinion, in these sorts of reports, is that we never talk about the quality of the education within Doncaster. Because if you are the CEO or the FD of a, of a company seeking to relocate into Doncaster, where are you going to send your ch children to school? Well, there aren't that gr many great schools in Doncaster. I, I have a daughter who's of school age in Doncaster. We're, we're looking at that issue right now. It's a major deterrent. Where are we addressing that? Um, where, are we, where is there in this about the planning? Um, what we're going to do about planning? And finally, because I literally could go on about this for hours, finally, um, this is more about health and well-being than it is about wealth creation. Health and well-being doesn't create wealth. Wealth creates health and well-being. And I think you've put the cart before the horse. Thanks, Steve. Let's let Mitch come come back on that. I think what we're hearing, Mitch, as as you knew when when you showed on your first slide, is that this is an economic strategy that has arms across the whole Doncaster delivering together, doesn't it? In, t in terms of the work we're doing, both from a sort of um, 
jobs per, jobs perspective from health and care, but also in terms of city centre education, etc. So I'm sure you're played into all of those arms of things. But do you, do you just want to come back on that? Yeah, yeah, um, happy to chair. I mean, uh, really important points. I think on the um, promoting the borough stuff, we're starting to reevaluate, the, especially the communications with business Doncaster around women investment. Um, we we kind of recognise. I'm meeting this, uh, this week about it. It's probably not the position it needs to be. Um, so reevaluating the comms on kind of um, Doncaster, a place to bring in with investment businesses. Uh, linking into the other points is City Centre Living. Um, we're looking to refresh the Urban Centre Master Plan over the next year to actually create what does that kind of city centre of the future look like and therefore what is that different mix within the city centre, why we're bringing into the wider issues of kind of uh, city centre to Terrence. So um, I believe Business Doncaster are looking to restart a lot of the retail forums within the city centre to start to get, you know, what are the issues of businesses, linking them straight into um, kind of the relevant networks, police, localities model, etc. Um, quality of education points um, important, and this is why we really want to integrate in with the education skill strategy. Um, so we're already working from an operational point of view with kind of um, Leanne, uh, Danny, and colleagues within that space to say what is that lifespan approach. So it's not just you know you have education skills here and the life course of education skills, and then you've got economy here. It is the 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 one thing really, and and. That's a, it's a different way to how we've approached things previously. We probably have been a little bit more siloed over the past decades with how we've delivered that stuff. So there will be some officer work about what that looks like. I think the competitiveness is, is really interesting and we're, we're putting pressure on the male combined authority um, to bring all the four local authorities to really start to say, well, okay, we've got our own individual local economic plans. There's a regional strategic economic plan, but how do we collaborate on this? So it's not um, competitive, it is collaborative. So again, we might be chasing um, similar sectors, what are, what are the individual niches across areas to make sure that all four local authorities uh, can prosper and it's not um, Sheffield heavy, for example. Thank you. Um, Rupert and then Rihanna and then Phil. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony, and, and thanks, Mitch. I mean, I think just sort of on Richard's point about the health and care sector, I suppose if the people in this room or the people who are on the place partnership aren't not only thinking about how do we deliver today's services, but how do we have a sustainable health and wellbeing system, then I don't know who else is going to do it. We probably need to ask ourselves a question about, you know, are, are we actually doing that in some of those meetings? Yeah. Are we looking ahead and doing this, or are we still sort of managing the fires? And I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is, and we're going to have to be really careful about this when we get to refresh the health and wellbeing strategy, is there are quite a lot of team Doncaster strategies that interrelate and how do we sort of see one of them in the context of the other because you know it's a great question from Steve in terms of well, how does this fit with skills and education but there is a skills and education strategy which we're probably as a um, some of us are more cited on than others so I think that's a challenge I think the thing for me I suppose that I'm slightly nervous about the strategy it's not about the balance that Steve said is Sometimes it reads as a bit sort of top down, like somehow this is going to sort of drip through, which is a bit like you were saying about you know what's in it that's that's different. And I suppose I didn't see enough in it around the localities and the locality way of working. And we know, you know, jobs at the I for people from where Cynthia's <laughs> representing, they will never travel that far so you know and transport's a key part of that and then I suppose the final bit is just thinking about what do we do as a board and I'm happy to pick up outside with Mitch and Emily but there are a number of actions in there and I'm I'm trying to sort of work out what are new actions or are, or are they things that are already in train and what are those actions are already reporting into this board through other route so are there a set of actions that we're actually we could be responsible for as a board whilst doing the particular work on the health and care sector so that's yeah, thanks Rupert I think that would be a valuable exercise and Ruth I think it'd be valuable to play you into that kind of work because Rupert's challenge and Richard's challenge about if we're not thinking about this for the future or in the wrong game we need to be seeing the avenues that we've got within our place partnership to do that at the moment particularly around workforce um, thank you, Rihanna.
So a couple of points. Couldn't agree more with what Rupert was just saying and happy to bring education and skills strategy to the board if that will be helpful in terms of what, we, what our ambitions are within that. Uh, just in, in direct response to some of the points that you're making, Steve, um, I'm happy to report that we are increasing our attainment um, and for all young people across all phase, phases and stages within Doncaster. We do have direct influence over schools in bringing up their standards and effectiveness. Um, and again, I'm happy to report that actually we are on a great trajectory of be uh, becoming more uh, good and outstanding schools within Doncaster. So hopefully that gives you some reassurance if you need to have a conversation about where your daughter receives education, happy to have that conversation as well. Thanks, Rihanna. That's good to that's good to hear. And there's a lot of work going on in that area, as we as we know. Phil. Yeah, I think um, I think again, it's good. These agendas don't come together by accident, do they? So when we're talking about the integrated care um, partnership strategy, then really, how are we coming together? to increase economic participation and support a fair, inclusive and sustainable economy. So something about us understanding, we don't want to repeat the economy and skills strategy, but understanding our role and relationship to it as employers, as, as, as a partnership. So I think that feels important. I, I'd mildly um, challenge Steve's point about um, health and well-being not creating wealth there might be a little bit of semantics in there somewhere but I think there's something about inclusive growth and I'll grip on that and there's something also about making sure from a health and well-being perspective and leaving nobody behind perspective that we don't see wealth as gentrification that drives particular groups out of, of particular geographies so I think there's there's something about how we see growth and health and well-being playing, playing a part of that, but we can play a role in making sure that people in Doncaster aren't left behind by growth and have an opportunity to participate in it. Um, from an adult social care perspective, because Mitch was asking for some specifics, next week we're going to cabinet with um, uh, our care and support, which is the local account that people in Doncaster, we've done some co-production, people lived experience have said they want us to focus on maybe chair i'll send it around as a as just as a for, for information and might be some other groups i need to engage with about it but one of the points there that people have said that they need us to be making clear progress on in 22 23 um is where is it sorry just want to get make sure i get the wording right um it's in front of me and i can't see it um, create and sustain more employment opportunities for autistic people, people with learning disabilities, and people in contact with secondary mental health services. So we need to do that. We morally need to do that anyway in Doncaster, including our own responsibilities as employers. So that's, a, that's an interface, I think, between adult social care activity and the work of your strategy. Thank you. Really helpful. Steve, do you want to come back on that? Uh, before we get into a philosophical um, debate, of it. I, I will quickly come back. Uh, Phil, um, I, it's very difficult to express complicated ideas in short sentences. I was in no way suggesting that we we ditch the idea of a healthier Doncaster in in, in favour of a wealthier Doncaster. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm fully committed uh, to the idea of uh, er eradicating health inequalities, and I think there will be a financial benefit to the city of doing that. I just think. Well, let's leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Nabil and then Richard. Um, so mine's a bit sort of different, you know, change of pace and a very specific point. I was mulling over whether just to catch you, you know, speak literally directly to you, but I thought I'd do it properly through the uh, forums. Um, so I was interested in the mention of working win um, in, in there and sort of that being a, a thing we can learn from. Um, but I know that working win's just closed uh, to new referrals on the 31st of December. So I was wondering whether that's, been or being evaluated sort of formally because I know it was a big thing wasn't it um, and then whether we're confident we can draw out the good things from that into what we take forward or where, whether we're going to have a, a new gap there because exactly the wrong time to have a new a new gap there and and I think as a, as a GP we get a lot where we feel a little bit caught in the middle of the patients telling us what their employer is saying and sometimes it seems really unreasonable and probably there's a bit of me that thinks it probably what they're saying is probably unreasonable and probably a bit where it's being reflected incorrectly and actually having something like that 
where you can, you know, where, where it's a bit of an impartial thing. And, and I'm sure for some people it gets them back into work, and I'm sure some people it's not the right mm -hmm. thing, but it just feels like we need something like that to, to carry on. Yeah, just, just on uh, working wins. So um, it's now delivered regionally, so they're looking at the financing from April 23 onwards, and that's why they've stopped referrals at the minute to get the confirmation of funding to carry that service over. I mean, we have to be at pace regardless if working wins carries on or not on what the positives those are and, and bring them into the stuff we have control on. So we have an employment hub at, at the council, we have an advanced program at the council, so stuff we can do tangibly. The longer term change will be how much we can influence kind of local DWP kind of advice, considering obviously we know obviously it's, it's dictated by um, national government most of the time, but no, it's, it's a really valid point. Thank you, Richard. It, it's just returning to the sort of principle of um, making sure that we all are cited in the way that Rupert describes, because what people on the Health Wellbeing Board may not know is that two of our major capital schemes for completing this year are um, the Mexpa Community Diagnostic Centre, which is a current government priority. We've done phase one and we've done phase two and phase three extends that um, facility. And tied to that is the Mexpa Elective Orthopaedic Centre, which is a centre of excellence for delivery of um, um, hip and knee replacement surgery for patients who've not got complex comorbidities. All of those, I think, will provide opportunities for wealth generation because uh, patients have visitors, visitors attend, visitors will want, you know, potentially cafes and other little things as distractions to sort of what, you know, can be tiring days. But also the volume of patients who will attend for CDC, I suspect, will have a similar demand. And so what we need to do is make sure that, um, you know, our uh, communities and our opportunities of commercial and the Chamber of Commerce and others know what actually health is planning on doing and developing so that they can then think as entrepreneurs about what opportunities may be there. Because, you know, whilst we've got some limited parking and then we've got parking, I suspect that that will be, a, you know, a challenging opportunity. We'll need to get people backwards and forwards to that, you know, and and actually it's just joining up that in terms of what what we're doing and what we're developing so that we don't miss the opportunity but i still think the most important and significant leap forward will be to resolve the student and the university issue because students at night need cinemas nightclubs restaurants and the sort of stuff that i think does generate commercial opportunity and income for entrepreneurs and others that can take advantage of it and actually, I suspect that the university, the place we might look more sensibly to put it, would be in the city centre on the piece of land that we were developing. And they probably will need a lot of accommodation, which in itself generate. So being sighted on our ambitions collectively and what we're doing in the short term, I think, is really important because I think personally I think there's a huge opportunity there and the opportunity will translate into actually different ambitions and different educational opportunities and long-term sustainable jobs because so one of the things that I can't personally see happening is the health and social care reduce in the short term and actually these are stable jobs that don't change much over time and actually give you careers uh, you know and the sorts of things that I think this board is interested in in terms of widest determinants of health and and generation like housing like the thing, things we've talked about thank you yep um, Steve. Just very briefly, if you look at uh, the history of Pittsburgh, which was the centre of the American steel uh, and coal industries, and is now one of the te top ten desirable places to live in the States, they've managed to turn their economy from steel and coal into what they call an eds and meds economy, education uh, and medicine, uh, and it's thriving. Uh, there's an opera house there, there's two, en uh, there's a, um, an NFL team, there's a uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins uh, ice hockey team. There's a, a, a an, M, uh, an MLB baseball team there, and the population of Pittsburgh I think is only 400, 500 thousand. So it, it's something we could aspire to in Doncaster. Uh, relative, well, it's something we could aspire to in Doncaster, which would be demonstrably different to our local competitors. Thanks, Just, Steve. Just, just on that, we are working with colleagues in Pittsburgh on a couple of things. We are yeah. learning as Pittsburgh as a place on education skills stuff and some of the yeah. stuff around business support. Uh, we've taken from Pittsburgh's kind of economic gardening principles. So uh, we have, we've noticed this as a place we actually can learn from. And as an American football fan, I'd love an NFL team here. Yeah. Oh, just, uh, just, just don't think, think they'll go London first though. But um, okay. 
Well, there, there's some homework to work on the uh, nickname for Doncaster uh, American football team. Okay, I think that's been a really helpful um, conversation. So, Mitch, Emily, thank you. We do recognise and endorse the Doncaster economic strategy to 2030, given some of the comments, though, that you've had. I'm sure you'll take that back into the, into the conversations. The second two bullet points, I think, is the work outside of here, which is, to, which is to see, really, the opportunities and the other collaborations that we've got through our, through our work across a, a range of sectors, but particularly within health and care. And, Mitch, what I'm particularly keen on is that we play this work into the burgeoning director of finance um, network that we've got across health and care uh, in Doncaster because what we are looking for is a, is a financial strategy um, for, for, for health and care around Doncaster that obviously will have to ring to this. Um, so thank you very much and uh, thanks Emily. Okay, so we've come to the um, end of the um, agenda. So John, you can tell Rachel that I finished early. Um, which didn't look likely at one point, did it? But um, I, I think I think that's uh, that. that we, we, there's been some themes out of this, Rupert, that I think we can really um, take away and do some do some work on. So thank you, everybody, for the presentations and the contributions. The date and time of the next meeting is Thursday, the 9th of March, um, nine o'clock, um, here. So uh, thank you all very much.